Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we will call to order. Uh, Mr. Clerk, do we have a quorum? Mayor Patterson, we do have quorum, but I would ask all members of council in the room to please make sure they're signed in. Okay, thank you. So first up is Committee of the Whole closed meeting. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Doherty, that Council resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole closed meeting to consider the following item. Labor Relations or Employee Negotiations, the Ontario Nurses Association Bargaining Negotiations. And that carries. Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju indio wachea kwekwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as a gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So uh, with that, we were just uh, in Committee of the Whole closed meeting. We did discuss one item with respect to bargaining negotiations with the Ontario Nurses Association. So I'll ask uh, for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Uh, your Worship, do I declare my account uh, pecuniary before we do this? So and then leave before we vote on the matter, or or do I? Um, or is it okay? Because I wasn't in the meeting. Mr. Clerk, can I see wrong? Can we? Can he just not vote? So, uh, Deputy Mayor Stroud, um, I would recommend that you give your declaration now, and then that way you can leave for uh, for the vote. Thank you. Um, I, Peter Stroud of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of closed meeting item 1A, Ontario Nurses Association bargaining negotiations, because I am a current member of the Ontario Nurses Association. And I've already given my, uh, my declaration to the clerks. So at this point, I'll, I'll invite you to, to step out, and then we will call the vote at that point. Moved by Councillor Chappelle, seconded by Councillor Neal, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, moving on to approval of the adeds. We have two delegations and a motion of condolence to add. Can I have a mover for the adeds, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hill. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any other disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Uh, we do have one presentation this evening. Doug Jeffries, board member of the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame, will present the inductees for 2019. Mr. Jeffries. Yes. On behalf of President Walter Trump, 
Fourth annual dinner to be held on Friday, May 3rd at the Ramada Inn. I would like to publicly acknowledge and thank the members of the selection committee for all their hard work resulting in the list of five. The names will be read alphabetically and as they are unveiled, we ask the inductee or their representative to stand while their bio is read. And to save time, please hold your applause until everyone is introduced. Adrian Tick Langlois. Now, Tick couldn't be here tonight. He is treating his family to a vacation down in Jamaica. Tick Langlois. Tick started a 27-year teaching career at Kingston Collegiate and Vocational Institute, and while there, Tick coached football, track and field, volleyball, gymnastics, and curling, and was the school's athletic director. He wrote the County of Frontenac High School Athletic Constitution in 1968, formalizing county policies and practices which are still used today. As well, Tick was president of the Eastern Ontario Secondary School Athletics Association and served as basketball, football, and track and field convener for many, many years. He was also the co-convener for the Ontario High School Track and Field Championships that were held here in Kingston back in 1978 at the old Richardson Stadium. Along with coaching and convening high school sports, Tick also coached hockey in the Church Athletic League and for the Queen's University Intermediates. He also served on the board for the Royal Kingston Curling Club and was the club president from 1983 to 1985. In 2010, Tick came out of retirement to coach the senior boys football team at KCBI so they could maintain their program, which they still have today. Adrian Tick Langlois. Bradley McFarlane. And uh, Brad's uh, brother is here on his behalf, Scott. A Kingston native, Brad amassed multiple championships in tennis as a youth and junior player in the 1980s and 90s. Between 86 and 95, Brad was a member of the Kingston Junior Elite Program, a member of Team Ontario and Team Canada. Brad attended the University of Michigan on a full athletic scholarship from 1996 to 2000, and while at the University of Michigan, Brad was the team captain in his final year for the Wolverines, where he was an academic Big Ten selection. Brad excelled in both singles and doubles competitions, winning both the Canadian under-14 singles and doubles titles in 1992. And while playing on Team Canada's junior national team that year, Canada defeated the United States in competition, the first time in Canadian tennis history that Canada had defeated the U.S. at any level. Brad also won the 1993 Ontario High School Doubles Tennis Championship for the Bay Ridge Blazers with his brother Scott. As a member of Team Canada in 1994, Brad helped his country win the team event at the Junior Davis Cup, and the next year he won the Canadian Under-18 Singles Championship, an incredible accomplishment. In 1994, Brad McFarlane won the Gus Marker Trophy as the Kingston Kiwanis Club Amateur Athlete of the Year. Bradley McFarlane. Gord McClellan, Gord is with us this evening. Gord has been a resident of Kingston since 1971. And prior to starting his coaching career, Gord was Rookie of the Year, Most Valuable Player, and an Ontario University All-Star while playing football for the Waterloo Warriors before transferring to the Queen's Golden Gales, where he was also an OUA All-Star. After university, Gord excelled as a coach in football and track and field from 1974 to 2003, first at Bay Ridge Secondary School and then at Sydenham High School. 
In that time frame, his teams won eight county football championships and 12 track and field titles. From 2003 to 2008, Gord was coach of the running backs and special teams with the Queens Golden Gales Football Club. And in 1999, he was inducted into the Queens Football Hall of Fame. Gord coached at sports camps in the summer and co-founded the Northern Lights Basketball League in 1987. He also was able to find time to coach T-ball for the kids, minor soccer, and hockey as well. And in 2003, the football field at Sydenham High School was named the Gord McClellan Field in honor of being a teacher, coach, and mentor to thousands of Sydenham High School students. Gord McClellan. Bruce Sheen. At age 14, Bruce moved to Kingston in 1968 and quickly became known as one of the most dominant basketball players of his generation. First at LaSalle Secondary School with the Black Knights, then at St. Lawrence College, where he led both teams in scoring every year he played. With the St. Lawrence Vikings, Bruce led the Ontario College's Athletic Association in scoring from 1975 to 77, averaging more than 27 points per game. He was also referred to as a consummate team player. Bruce continued to play with men's basketball teams for several years in Kingston and was recruited to play for teams from Toronto where he won multiple championships and tournaments. And after retiring as a basketball player, Bruce became a volunteer coach with the Knights of Columbus Basketball League, now the Pete Peterson League, and the Pacers Basketball League, where he served as president for several years. Bruce Sheen. And Ken Talek. Ken has been a martial arts instructor since 1972, excelling in karate. In 1994, he moved to Kingston and has passed on his martial arts skills to thousands of young people in the Kingston area. He is a community leader, a champion for his charity work, and an icon in the field of martial arts. For many years, Ken was an official with the Ontario Athletics Commission as well as a volunteer instructor with the Boys and Girls Club of Greater Kingston. And in 1996, Ken established the Kingston Open Karate Championships. Ken also founded the Karate Kids Program, which provides affordable martial arts instruction to students with the Limestone District School Board and the Algonquin and Lakeshore Catholic District School Board. As well, his Kids Helping Kids Christmas fundraiser for the Salvation Army has raised over $125,000. Ken has also received the Canadian Karate Kung Fu Association Lifetime Achievement Award, and in 2017, Ken was inducted into the Canadian Black Belt Hall of Fame. Ken Talek. Well, Mayor Patterson, and members of council, there you have it. You have the newest members of the Kingston and District Sports Hall of Fame. The illustrious group now totals 183. Once again, we thank you for this forum, for the first public unveiling of the latest group of inductees. And we now ask the inductees, their family and members of the board, to stand as we exit Memorial Hall for some coffee and conversation. We thank you again.
Well, thank you very much, and again, uh, congratulations to all this year's inductees. Uh, at this point, we will move on in our agenda. We do have two delegations. Uh, the first delegation is Kim Wright, Vice President of Public Affairs of Hill Knowlton Strategies, who appear before Council to speak to Clause 1, Report Number 8, received from the CAO, with respect to cannabis retail stores in Kingston. And just a reminder to our delegations that you have five minutes. Ms. Wright. bringing my trusty stopwatch with me. Good evening, Mayor Patterson and members of council. Uh, I have been a pleasure to meet uh, some of you and looking forward to engaging with others. I'm here this evening on behalf of my client, Fire and Flower. Uh, they are in the process of becoming, as they call it, Canada's cannabis retailer. Uh, with uh, operating stores already in Alberta and Saskatchewan. I have been engaged with uh, Fire and Flower to have conversations with municipalities and councillors across Ontario, and I'm delighted to be before you here today. Fire and Flower represents a new era, but we're also in a new era of cannabis itself, uh, as legalization has happened uh, since October 17th, but also as we move into the conversation around edibles and consumables, which will come to the legal market here in Canada in October of this year, uh, so not very far away as, uh, as those conversations engage. Uh, there has been a number of conversations to be had, certainly uh, the way the Ontario government has evolved this program in the last year, and certainly I'm, I'm happy to have that conversation as well. In terms of one of the conversations that I've been having, it's really been about shedding some of the stigmas. Whatever your personal history might be, your friendly uh, experience in high school or college and university, or even at a dispensary, that's not what we're talking about here today. And in fact, those types of programs are not allowed under the Health Canada regulations, which are incredibly stringent but from essentially seed to consumption. Uh, there's also an awful lot of public education that my client has engaged in as part of their development of their program. What was interesting a couple of weeks after legalization was a bus of seniors showed up as part of their uh, from the local nursing home who wanted to understand the different types of products, the oils, the sprays, those that have THC content, those that are just a CBD based. So really engaging in that public education conversation. Just as important is the conversation around community and safety and security. How you run your store, including how you store the products, uh, which are also highly regulated through Health Canada, uh, as well as some of the security measurements uh, around your vault and your storage. Fire and Flower also ensures that they do a double age gate at all of their stores, which means regardless of how old you may or may not look, you need to produce ID both at the door as well as checkout. We find that that's important to ensure that the customers that are coming in are coming in for the appropriate reasons. We also make sure that we're looking at distance separations and engage uh, in distance separations that frankly often exceed uh, municipal and provincial jurisdiction. So Fire and Flower, uh, as you can see on this map, they are operational in Alberta and Saskatchewan. They have licenses in Alberta, and they will be applying for the up to 75 licenses uh, that a, a retailer can have in Ontario. I know there's questions around the lottery and how that will work, but over the course of the next uh, several uh, months and years, uh, they will be applying for all those licenses and would like to be in Kingston. This is some of the management team, which includes uh, Harvey Shapiro, who comes from Dynacare, uh, as well as uh, Nadia Vadavaz, who comes to Fire and Flower from Holt Renfrew. We try to bring the best from the retail experience, but also uh, pharmaceutical and food and beverage. You'll also see on this list Norm Inkster, who's the former head of Interpol and the RCMP. We take safety and security quite seriously. So what does a legal dispenser, a, dis, a retailer look like? Well, this is actually the store in Edmonton. You'll notice at the top where the word fire is that there's a blue light. That's actually so if there is any sort of an emergency, emergency services can find them quickly instead of in a strip mall of any other lights. They'll be able to find it quickly. But you'll also see you can't see in the windows. It's a pretty nondescript building. This is what it looks like inside. You don't see jars of cannabis everywhere. That's not allowed. You have, there are sample jars, but those cannot be sold if there is a cracked excise stamp. All of the product needs to be uh, secured away. 
And really, it's about engaging with customers. You'll also see that we have menu boards. Those menu boards, as you can imagine, quite change as the conversations unfold, as products come into the marketplace. And there is a wide range. There are things that have THC, which are the hallucinogenic components. There are those that just are CBD-based. There are an entire range of products, uh, from sprays to oils. 30 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, that, But it really is about engaging with people to understand what are their needs, what are they looking for, uh, and really what are the types of uh, programs that will work for them. Really it's about ensuring that we have strong communities, ensuring that people have a bricks and mortar experience so they can talk to people, so they understand what those products are, that they have access to safe products, and that it's done in such a way that the consumer understands what they're getting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, I'm one of three uh, members of Council that sit on public health. And I, I'm wondering how collaboratively your, the company you represent has worked with uh, community public health organizations. Absolutely. It is part of, they really see themselves as educators first, and part of that is engaging with governments as well as community, but also public health. What's been fascinating uh, to see some of the uh, jurisdictions in the U.S., uh, how they've evolved since legalization in their states, what's been really interesting is the shift from people who have consumed in a smoked format, uh, is what you sort of traditionally think of, uh, to uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> other types of products. It's actually been a marked reduction of, of those who consume through smoke. So I think it, it is certainly something we are engaging with public health uh, and will continue to do such. And my final question um, has to do with um, zoning issues. Mm -hmm. I know that uh, the previous government had suggested, I think it was 500 meters from any schools and uh, and the current government is talking about 150 meters. Uh, are you familiar with the kind of zoning application in BC or Saskatchewan, Alberta? Yeah, so Alberta has certainly a higher uh, level of sensitive uses than the Ontario government uh, puts forward. Uh, and we've looked to those and, and where Alberta is, in fact, my client's uh, home jurisdiction, if you will. Uh, so they've taken those as part of their guiding principles. They look at things like coupons and anything that's doing a, any sort of sensitive uses and making sure that they're, they're placed in a position that's appropriate. Now, I can't stand before you in all honesty and sincerity and say that every uh, applicant before you will take those types of things into consideration, but I can certainly tell you that my client takes that quite seriously in the jurisdictions in which they represent. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor Stroud. Sorry. Any microphone will do. <laughs> thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was really interested with what you said about the, uh, the function of the storefront that maybe it goes, uh, that people don't realize, and I wonder if you could elaborate. So, uh, no matter what we decide, people will be able to buy, and they are already buying cannabis on through the online retailers. So, what is the difference? We really need to down to brass tacks. The difference in a community that has a storefront, like what does could your company, or the, your client's company, do at in the in-person sessions when people come in that can't be done online? That's a great question. I often look at my own shopping experience of what things I buy online and things I'd rather go into a store and understand how they fit for me. Uh, that's sort of my, my base level of that. But it really is a conversation about what are the various product types because there is such a wide range of products that people don't quite know what they are, what they may or may not do for them. So if you're really just going online and seeing all of these different product types, you really need to have that conversation with people. And that's why we've seen in community after community, in surveys after surveys, where, where whether, wherever you fall on the spectrum of wanting uh, cannabis to be legal or not, what they want is that bricks and mortar experience so they can go in and really understand the products and really have that conversation with somebody. And that's, we actually, uh, we both have the tables as you saw. 
uh, but also one-on-one -on -one spaces for people to have that conversation as well. Thanks. My other question has to do with the concern I had from a resident about the effect of cannabis on young developing minds. Now, I know that the, there's, an, there'll be an, there's an Ontario law with the age majority for such products. Uh, what does the storefront or what is the store, what is the process, it, has it been determined to verify age majority for that, uh, that the, and are you allowed in the store if you are below that age? That's a great question, Councillor, and, and for, sorry, Mr. Deputy Mayor. Uh, and it's important to note, and as I said in my presentation, I may have rushed through it a bit, they do double age gating. So before you even walk into a store, you have to produce your identification, government issued identification with your age on it. In fact, when my colleague was in the Edmonton store a couple of weeks ago, uh, randomly, he was sort of doing a mystery shopper type of thing. He actually saw them checking ID, uh, and it was somebody who clearly was over the age of majority in Alberta uh, and was not allowed in the store because that person didn't have identification. So it, it is making sure that not only before you enter a store that you're being checked, but then double checking at, uh, at checkout as well. Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. There is a letter um, in the newspaper back in April where someone said that they heard in the United States for some of the legal retailers, illegal sellers will stand in front of the store and try to undercut the customers going into the legal retail stores. Have you had that experience anywhere in Canada with your stores? That's not been the experience my client has had. What I can tell you is the experience that we've seen is that, it, especially in, this, in the U.S. and in other jurisdictions, uh, that where you enter legal products into the marketplace, that people want that experience. They understand where the pr product was produced and what's in that product and what are the dosage rates and all of that. Uh, so they want to understand what's in the product. They want to understand what it will do for them. Uh, while there will be people in the black market who still try to survive, the more you have a spotlight and a public uh, acknowledgement of the product that is legal in Canada, uh, the more that they, the black market subsides. Now, I, I, I'm not going to tell you that you get rid of the black market entirely, but what you do is do, you do diminish it uh, exponentially. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Council. Okay, we'll move on to our second delegation this evening, Dave St. Ange, President of the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites, and Bill Visser, Vice President of the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites, will appear before Council, speak to Clause 3 of Report Number 7 from the CAO with respect to the renewal of the service level agreement between the City of Kingston and the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites. Thank you, Your Worship, councillors and guests. Thank you for allowing us to speak to you tonight. Um, we are here actually to introduce you to the Kingston Association Museums, Galleries and Historic Sites. We'll refer to it as CAM from here, um, who we are and what we do. Um, we are uh, an alliance of uh, museums, historic sites and art galleries, no surprise there. Um, we formed in 1980. Uh, informally, we met monthly uh, to share experiences, advice, uh, and uh, in a collegial setting. In, in 2009, we incorporated formally with the support of the city, and this has enabled us to work more closely with the city um, in the years since. We're also an active member of the Ontario Museums Association. Um, our obje objectives uh, are to, uh, through advocacy, to strive to educate um, all levels of government about the value that our members provide, and as such, uh, we can speak as one common voice rather than a number of uh, individual voices. We believe that the social value that we provide enhances our quality of life in the community, uh, both for residents and for visitors to the city. By actively supporting tourism, industry, and uh, education, we provide yet another reason why Kingston is a great place to live, work, and play. Uh, number two in our uh, objectives, uh, we support our member sites by providing a clearinghouse for ideas and resources. We interface with the Ontario Museums Association, so we can um, speak as a collective group. We're also a member of their, regional, uh, their new regional museums network. We also provide disaster and recovery support for our members. Uh, for example, um, a number of years ago when the McLaughlin Museum had a flood, uh, we, we were able to provide some uh, manpower and supplies to help them recover from that. We keep an emergency kit at one of our sites for that purpose. 
Um, thirdly, we uh, work to uh, increase public awareness. We have a number of collaborative partnerships with uh, groups in town, uh, to Tourism Kingston, the Kingston Arts Council, Kingston Accommodation Partners, Kingston Destination Partners, um, Beyond Classrooms Kingston, St. Lawrence Parks Commission, to name a few. Uh, we've jointly uh, put together a residence pass for local visitors or local residents to visit our sites. We do joint marketing campaigns. Uh, we developed a wayfinding signage package, uh, you may have noticed around town, for pedestrians and cyclists to find their way to our sites. We also developed a museum uh, orientation pass for frontline museum employees, uh, hotels, and it's branched into some retailers have showed an interest. Upwards of 300 uh, local um, people have uh, participated in that program. And in 2017, we hosted the Ontario Museum Association Conference for the second time. Um, within our uh, organization, we have three levels of membership, uh, individual, associate, and institutional. Uh, individual memberships are for people who are sympathetic to our uh, purpose and, and, uh, and interest in museums. Associates are groups and organizations, likewise interested in us. And uh, the institutional uh, memberships are for museums, galleries, and historic sites that actually maintain collections and occupy uh, heritage buildings and whatnot. Currently, we have more than 50 members uh, across that, uh, that program. Um, internally, we have um, 1.5 paid summer, uh, paid staff positions year round. Uh, we have uh, had some Canada summer jobs grants. We had seven student positions this year. Uh, we work with Queen's and St. Lawrence College for internships, and we have more than 20 dedicated and very active volunteers who are supported by our, our paid staff. Uh, we. Uh, in the form of activities and services, we have a number of committees. We have an advocacy committee, which Bill is uh, the chair. Um, we have a marketing committee, professional development committee, and a programming community engagement committee. Um, a number of these uh, groups have been very, very active and uh, work with their collaboration. Uh, we also collaborate with other uh, similar sectors in other communities uh, through the uh, involvement with the Ontario Museum Association. Um, our, one of the main functions we do is uh, to administer the, the City of Kingston Heritage Fund um, on behalf of, um, or in, in partnership with, uh, with uh, cultural services. Um, we also do some public engagement. We've had a program over the past year for uh, pop-up museums in untraditional sites, in um, hockey rinks and um, pubs and places like that, so. 30 seconds. Okay. Um, Service level agreement was first uh, signed in 2011. It's key to our ability to provide all of these services in a professional manner. Um, we've uh, enjoyed uh, the support of the city ever since uh, 2011 in that regard. The major component, as I mentioned before, is the Heritage Fund. Um, I think you've got some information as to uh, the current uh, program. Um, our, our goals in this regard is to realize growth in the fund, in the participation in the fund, and ultimately in the, the resulting array of benefits to the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from Council? Councillor Doherty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. St. Ange, for your presentation. I had the pleasure of meeting the association a few weeks ago, and I was so impressed with the dedicated vo volunteers that I met, and I had a lengthy conversation with the one uh, full-time paid staff member, and, and how much you achieve. You really do enhance um, life here in Kingston, and the, for the tourists that come here as well. So thank you very much for your hard work. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. So thank you for that. Just a reminder, this is uh, questions only, please. Mm -hmm. Councillor Neal. So you find a way to say something nice, but put it in the form I, of a I question. I give you a little bit of a preamble. <laughs> I give you a little bit of preamble, but then make sure you I, ask your question at the end. Yeah. I had Councilor the pleasure Neal. last year of seeing some of the pop-up museums, and it was an excellent program. Will that be happening again in the upcoming we do, uh, season? We do hope to continue that, yes. Absolutely. We had, I think, upwards of 800 um, participants over the program. Lots of interesting artifacts were brought by, by members of the public from their private collections based on the given theme. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, 
One of the notes that I made reading through the report is that you've looked to diversify your revenue. And uh, now mm -hmm. about two thirds comes from the service level agreement. Mm -hmm. Are you continuing that process to Absolutely. find more streams? Absolutely. We are actively trying to find, find other sources of funding and, and uh, other means of raising revenues. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving on, we have no briefings this evening. Are there any petitions to present? Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Uh, on behalf of Countryside Crescent in, uh, out in Glen Burnie, I have a petition for road improvements. We, the residents of Countryside Crescent, petition the City of Kingston to resurface this road. The subdivision of 21 homes is more than 35 years old, and to date, no significant work over 35 years has been done to this road. Because of poor grading, dangerously large potholes, that form during thunderstorms and the culverts that no longer drain adequately. There are no proper shoulders on this crescent. Sand and gravel are plowed onto the boulevards each year. Uh, the subdivision has a diverse population, ranging in age from seniors to young children. Riding bikes and pushing strollers and simply walking is becoming increasingly difficult to the many potholes and the crumbling road surface. We fear that someone will either get hurt by tripping uh, while walking or falling on a bike. Because of the poor, con poor condition of this road, rollerblading is no longer possible around the Crescent. We petition the City of Kingston to include this road work in the next four years operating budget. Thank you very much. And I'll be passing around photos as well that uh, speak a thousand words and uh, explain it even, even more. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any other petitions? Okay, seeing none, we do have one motion of condolence. Moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Neal. That the condolences of Kingston City Sorry, Council please. be extended to the family of the late Linda Chartier, former City of Kingston Property Standards Officer, who passed away on December 26, 2018. Our thoughts are with her family during this difficult time. So we will call the vote, please. And that carries. Okay, we have no deferred motions, so we'll move on to report number seven from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Hill, seconded by Councillor Boehm, that report number seven from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. So there are four clauses. Would anyone like any of the clauses separated? Councillor Neal, number four. Are there any other separations? Councillor Holland? Councillor, or sorry, clause three, please. <laughs> number three. Okay. Any other separations? Okay, so we will first vote on uh, Clause 1 and Clause 2. Clause 1 is the 2019 Municipal Borrowing, borrowing Bylaw, and Clause 2 is the 2019 Interim Tax Levy. So we will call the vote on those two items, please. Please vote. And that carries. Clause three, renewal of the service level agreement between the City of Kingston and the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites. Councillor Holt. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, um, my question is mostly regarding the, um, um, some of it was answered already with the presentation, the ongoing operational support of CAM um, and how it relates to the operations at cultural services, specifically the, um, the heritage work the muse the, the city owned and operated museums so is there um it's just it's a very general question but just thinking about how these two work together and if that if there are um if there is any sort of potential conflict i guess in a way considering the fact that the cultural services museums receive funding and operation support and then we have a different organization i'm just i'm kind of trying to get a sense at this point of how um whether the support that w that is in the service level agreement is sufficient and how it relates to other spending for museums um, owned and operated by the city mr wigginton 
to your worship, um, a big, just to give a bit of context, a big part of cultural services mandate is what we call sector development. So it's investing in both arts and heritage locally. And through that uh, initiative, we support both the Kingston Arts Council and the Kingston Association of Museums that you're hearing from tonight, both as umbrella organizations that are arm's length from the city and help to do sector development in their respective spheres. And then through those relationships, they also uh, either facilitate the City of Kingston Arts Fund or the City of Kingston Heritage Fund. So just to give you that bit of context, uh, yes, the city does operate museums as part of our mandate as well. And uh, one of the challenges that we um, face, well, I mean, we're also members of CAM, so we're part of that community and we have city support to run those museums. Uh, but through CAM, as a service organization, they also then in turn support other uh, museums in Kingston as well. So it helps to develop the, the vibrancy of the, the sort of whole landscape and ecology here in Kingston as it relates to museums and heritage. Uh, one of the challenges in Kingston that's always been uh, uh, something we've had to address and it's something that CAM works on is the fact that we have a broad range of, of museum type organizations in Kingston from volunteer run uh, to very well established uh, organizations to provincial and federal bodies as well running museums. So it's quite a diverse field. So I think it's uh, that diversity brings a lot of vibrancy, but also some unique challenges that are particular to Kingston. So, um, you know, I think it's important that we have an umbrella organization like CAM that's helping to develop the sector as a whole. That notion of rising tides float all boats, that professional development is equally accessible and advocacy and, and public awareness and, and collaborative programming as they talked about this evening. And then the funding uh, helps to fill in and support those various initiatives in different ways as well, because something that perhaps isn't as clear uh, when you look at uh, particularly the question related to diversification of funding, and I've mentioned this before around the horseshoe, is that there aren't robust funding programs for museums and heritage across the country, either federally or provincially, as there are in relation to the arts. So uh, groups like the Kingston Association Museums, as well as museums in Kingston and any other community, are somewhat limited in what they can access. So I think the municipal funding is really key to support sustainability, help those organizations to leverage other sources of funding. But operational funding is a real challenge because so much of it tends to be uh, project-based uh, as a mechanism. Thanks. Yeah, the context is really useful. Um, I think, I guess, I'm, I'm just a follow up. The, um, the, the current, the operation since 2011, I guess, since the introduction of the service level agreement, um, has a, it seems to me that the development of the city run museums has really grown in, since that time. Um, and given that those are publicly, completely publicly supported museums, are we seeing the same kind of growth with CAM with this current level of funding? Through your worship, I, I think we do see growth. Um, you know, I would say that our museums, the McLaughlin Woodworking Museum and the Pump House Steam Museum are comparable to other community museums like the Agnes Etherington Art Center, like the Museum for Healthcare, uh, like the Marine Museum. Uh, through the Heritage Fund, we've also seen some smaller operations that have been largely volunteer run, like the Frontenac County Schools Museum, uh, be able to increase their capacity and therefore increase their ability to operate at a more professional level. And so we, we see these organizations moving through a growth sort of cycle together and, and in combination with each other, which I think is important. So, you know, I, I don't think it's a, a conflict necessarily that the museum, museum operates museums, or that the city operates museums, sorry, um, but that we have to be actively contributing to the development of the sector overall. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to add and maybe give uh, Council a couple of examples that you might um, better understand in terms of building community capacity while we're still, uh, as a city, delivering similar services. So in recreation, for example, we provide a variety of services, but we do have agreements with Boys and Girls Club where we do provide uh, financial support. Same thing with Seniors Association, but that doesn't prevent the city from providing um, youth and uh, seniors services when it comes to recreation. So it, it's about the partnership and it's about trying to build the community capacity. 
Councillor Neal. Yes, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, just very quickly, I know um, I've been active on uh, the grant process uh, for museums and for the arts. I know that originally our, uh, our cultural master plan and, and our funding formula uh, was a little bit uh, more ambitious than we've been able to realize. Uh, this year, do you anticipate, will, will uh, there be a recommendation at budget coming from staff to, to look at uh, uh, an increase and potentially greater than an uh, inflationary increase? Mr. Wiginton? Through your, your worship, yes, that is the case. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but uh, generally we've been trying to increase the arts fund by inflation because it's already at a certain level, but with the heritage fund we've been investing more aggressively, and so the 2019 budget includes an inflationary increase plus a one-time increase of approximately $50,000. Uh, and that's one of the things that we'll be looking at with the Heritage Fund review as well, is to make sure that the the size of the funding envelope is is relevant to the kind of support that's being requested by the community. Thank you. I look forward to that. Councillor Sinek. Thank you, Your Worship. And um, about that, I think just I need a reminder with that um, Heritage Fund review, that's when we're going to see if there's any comparator cities out there funding their museums because they might not have as much rich history as we have. Like we saw one article, one, um, one fun fact sheet sent to us during the election, I think, that said there's more museums per capita in Kingston than any other city in Ontario. And uh, I would, never would have thought that. I thought maybe Ottawa would have more. So um, with that Heritage uh, Fund review, that's when we might see like what other funding other cities are giving their museums and how we might compare. Is that true? To your worship, that is correct. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 3, please. And that carries. Clause 4, Council Strategic Planning Priority Setting Process. Councillor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, this is a really, really important process that we only have an opportunity to do once every uh, every four years, uh, and using the we broadly because we may not be here four years from now. Uh, but I think it's really, really important that uh, that we're able to move ahead uh, and do priority setting. And I know from speaking to uh, many of my colleagues here on council, we've, we've discussed um, how imperative it is to also have, seek some public input and some uh, public consultation. And we also should make sure that that process is very transparent and that we aren't predisposing uh, or trying to control that uh, process uh, too much, and um, I know and I look forward to the opportunity uh, to support uh, amendments that would bring in and ensure that kind of uh, broad public consultation uh, so that it isn't uh, the 13 of us doing the best we can, but it's the community that's doing the best uh, to, to lay out those priorities. So I will support any, any motion or amendment that does so. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair, Your Worship, and I recognize you. Thank you very much. Uh, I too would like to speak strongly in favor of the staff recommendation that's before us. And I say that as somebody who has gone through this process twice before, it is a highly effective and a fair way for 
13 people with very diverse political opinions to come together and work to support a common plan. And I look around the table. We have very diverse ideas and very diverse priorities, and we are fresh off of what I believe is one of the most effective public engagement processes imaginable. It's called an election, where we talk with thousands of people, and we have a really good sense of what the pulse of the community is. So it's a great way to kick off the council term. It's, a, it's an excellent process, and to be clear, for those of you that have not gone through this process before, it is 100% council-led. Uh, when we sit down together, it is all of council. Uh, the CAO is there to answer questions and to provide some high-level uh, uh, financial parameters or other guidance, but it's basically us. And we spend an entire night putting forward priorities, and then we spend another night wordsmithing because this is going to be a guiding document for us as a council. So it's a really, really important process. But I do agree with what Councillor Neal has raised, that we have heard over the last couple of years, and certainly I know that a number of councillors and myself have spoken with staff about this, um, that there should be additional opportunities for the public to, uh, to engage with us and to provide input in advance of this session so that we understand uh, all of the, the ideas and the thoughts that are happening in our community so that uh, we include everything that should be included in this, in this session. So I am uh, quite happy to put forward uh, an amendment that speaks to that. So while I think that the overall proce process is very fair and effective and I don't think that we need to, to reinvent the wheel when it works so well, I think that there is an opportunity to make it better with some consultations. So uh, I do have an amendment that I would like to, to put forward. Uh, it's been seconded by Councillor Neal, and Deputy Mayor, if you would be uh, willing to, to read it, and if I have the opportunity to speak to the amendment, that would be, uh, that would be great. Sorry, I was just reading it to uh, process it, but I'll, just re I'll do that as I read it out loud. <clears throat> so moved by Mayor Patterson and seconded by Councillor Neal that Report 7, Clause 4, received from the CAO consent, be amended by inserting the following after Paragraph 3. That Council invite public input into the st strategic planning process through written submissions from community stakeholder groups and an online survey and that a special meeting of council in a modified open house format be held on Tuesday, February 19th, 2019 in Memorial Hall at 6 p.m. prior to the strategic planning sessions where members of the public can share ideas and input with members of council and that council receive a compilation from the above noted public consultation in advance of the strategic planning sessions and Oh, and that's the leading in the rest There's of the There's another clause talk. after that. Okay. Yes, so, uh, yeah, Your Worship, you have the floor for the amendment. Thank you. So just to speak to a couple of the details of, of this particular amendment, it's designed in such a way to cast as broad a net as possible. So the idea is that this would allow people to uh, provide us input online. It would allow for people to provide us input in person. It allows for individuals or groups to provide us input face-to-face -face through an open house format. So it's trying to uh, have a broad array of methods by which people can put forward their ideas and also a very broad net in terms of what sort of input they would like to provide, whether it's input on the context, on our strengths and weaknesses as a community, or on particular ideas or issues that we should be looking at or things that should be directly included in our strategic planning process. So it's specifically designed to be as, as open as possible so that whether you're an individual, if you're a stakeholder group, whoever you are, that everybody would feel included in this particular input process. So with that, uh, I think that this is a, an excellent way to, to strengthen what is already a very effective uh, priority setting process, and certainly I would um, ask Council to, uh, to support it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Who else want, wants to speak to the amendment? Councillor Neal. Yes, thank you very much. I totally support the amendment. Um, I think this is a really thorough uh, and very comprehensive way in a fairly short period of time to gather the, uh, public input. And I think it's important. We all heard, for instance, and I would be shocked if we don't 
talk about housing and homelessness when we set our priorities, because we all heard that at the door. But I don't think, uh, I, I think it, it's, it's a better process to hear it again and to hear those other issues that come up. And so that it also ensures, at least, I think, uh, the potential for not having a pet project of four or five councillors to be suddenly pushed to the fore, we need to make sure that the community uh, wants to endorse or support those ideas. So I'm looking forward to, uh, to this broadened process and I think it'll be a, a better, uh, unimproved strategic planning process. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Neal. Next on my list is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you. I have a question about the timing of this amendment. Uh, the first paragraph doesn't mention any specific timing, for example, how long the online survey would be available and when. The second paragraph does mention a specific time and date um, for a uh, town hall. And then the third paragraph, again, is vague on timing, saying in advance of strategic planning. I'm wondering if we could have more details about the duration of this potential engagement process. So I would ask the, uh, I guess, the clerk to perhaps uh, give us a little bit of uh, feedback on what this amendment as it stands would mean for the first and third clauses of the amendment and the timing. Through you, Deputy Mayor, I think that question is more relevant to the mover of the motion as opposed to myself. Okay. Your Worship, you're back on. Thank you. And to uh, Councillor Kiley's questions, excellent questions. Um, certainly with respect to the online survey and the window for written submissions, I would suggest that that uh, could be opened quite quickly. I would obviously uh, defer to, to staff and to our communications department in terms of setting up the, the portal, obviously making sure that it, the survey is designed properly. Uh, and fortunately, we've done a lot of work on online surveys, so I think that there's a lot of expertise in-house about exactly how we would design that, roll that out. Um, perhaps we could, we could um, ask for an update on when that would, that, uh, would come out, but certainly would be designed to be open for what would be the standard amount, so certainly several weeks, uh, so that everyone has an opportunity in advance of the uh, sessions at the, the end of, of March. So I think that gives a little bit of flexibility, and certainly to the, to the third clause, uh, about uh, when we would receive that compilation. I would suggest that probably after the window for the online submissions uh, is completed. Obviously, that takes a bit of time probably to compile that after the open house, uh, but clearly uh, in advance of the, the sessions so that we are all provided with the same information and all understand uh, all of those raw materials before we walk into that first session. Councillor Kiley, you still have four minutes remaining. Through you, Deputy Mayor, um, the mover has addressed some of my concerns, particularly the ability for us as councillors to process the information that's made available, and further that individuals in the community do have enough time to be made aware of this consultation process. Um, so in the spirit of that and trusting the fact that we have in fact used similar mechanisms for other significant issues, uh, I'm satisfied. Thank you. Next, I saw two hands over there. I think I saw Councillor Chappelle first. So you're next, Councillor Chappelle. My question is actually for the clerk. Um, with respect to uh, property tax releases, what timing is that happening? And would there be a possibility of putting an insert of information about public input for uh, in the tax bill? Thank you, Council, for the question. Uh, once again, I would defer that to the uh, Chief Financial Officer to respond. Madam Treasurer. So we have just finalized the insert. I, I believe it's not gone to the printer yet, but I believe it's going to the printer by next week. So it's a little tight at this point to send it back to communications to change. That would be for the interim bill. It might be possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so you could follow up with the uh, staff uh, after the meeting. Councillor Chappelle, do you have anything else to say? Yes, uh, through you, your, you know, your worship. I believe that uh, looking at uh, what is being proposed, uh, what some of the concerns I had about public consultation seem to be addressed. It certainly appears to me that uh, the additional opportunities for submitting uh, input, um, reaching out to stakeholders, I, I'm certain that this motion, this amendment does not preclude individual councillors from meeting with stakeholder groups. And if that, okay, you're nodding positively. So thank you, that uh, would address the concerns that I had, thank you. Thank you. Next, oh, go ahead, uh, Your Worship. If I could, just as the mover, just to respond to that. So certainly myself as an individual member of council, when I am speaking with community stakeholders, I would, if this passes, I would point them to this. So I would, when I'm talking with them and I'm hearing about their ideas or concerns, I would say, okay, here are your options. You can go online and put a submission in, you can write us a written submission, or you can come to the open house. Those would be the vehicles by which you can make sure that your, your voice has been heard. Next on my list is Councillor Doherty. Thank you, and through you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'm just, I really like the extra opportunities for feedback. I have a, one question about the second point. What, what do you mean by modified open house? Please go ahead. Thank you. So um, the, open, the open house format is designed to be informal and less intimidating than a more traditional formal setting where uh, we're all sitting up at the front and people have to come to a, to a microphone. So um, uh, if you imagine a, the, the workshop open house format where we would be stationed, for example, Memorial Hall, all as individuals, and then people are free to come up and speak to us as, as individuals, uh, I would envision where you would have uh, placards where people can write down ideas and input as well. Um, but in that way, being less formal, uh, this is in the spirit of our public engagement strategy to really make things more accessible for people. Uh, for example, speaking here in council chambers can be pretty intimidating for people, whereas an environment where we're just all standing as individuals makes it easier for people to approach us. Councillor Dory, do you have any other? Okay. Next on my list is Councillor Holland. Thank you, um, Deputy Mayor Stroud. I have a question that's in part for the clerk, and I'm positive it's partly for the clerk. Uh, so February 19th, the second portion of this amendment, February 19th is um, a council meeting at 7.30. So this is scheduled at 6, and I'm just curious if that, like given potentially the need for a closed session, if there is enough time or if there should be a, a if that time could be, should be tentative or a different time I'm not sure if there's enough time. Well, thank you for that question. Uh, we do need to have a definitive time in place because it is a special meeting of council. Uh, we'll work with the senior staff to determine the need for a closed session. If there is a closed session, we will either work it before uh, this particular session or we'll put it in as part of the uh, regular council meeting later on in the evening. But either way, we think that that hour and a half will be sufficient to be able to have this exercise. Okay, thank you. Oh, and also I support the amendment. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Osanek. Thank you. My comment and question is about the online survey. So one of the things that we're doing differently at our strategic session this year is we're doing a SWOT analysis, the strengths, weakness, opportunities, and threats regarding Kingston. So with the online survey, I'd be interested in hearing what the public want, you know, has as their input into SWAT. So I don't know if the survey is gonna be 80 questions or only, you know, six questions, but I would like four of the questions to be directed as what, what are Kingston's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Um, I think that would be really helpful. So staff are here tonight hearing that, and if it's okay with the mover, and the seconder that that could be part of the online survey, then I don't think we need to move an amendment on the amendment, but I just wanted to put in that input. Uh, I guess we need a response from staff to confirm that this is possible. Commissioner Hurdle. Through you, uh, Deputy Mayor, yes, uh, we've heard the, the comments and we can include that as part of the survey. 
Okay, Councilor Bohm. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and through you. So uh, the mayor did mention uh, earlier that uh, several of us had kind of brought this up, and I know I brought it up uh, a few, quite a few times over the last couple of years. And uh, sometimes change is, is not big motions. Sometimes change is just subtle conversations, and it's talking to the public, and then it's going in and speaking with staff and trying to figure out how can we approach this without totally reinventing the wheel? How can we take what in my mind has been effective but yet make it better. And in this instance, that's exactly what this motion does. So I know I was out there hearing from people and oftentimes it was, you know, how do we pick the priorities? How, how, do, we, how do we get to this document at the end of the day that's gonna guide us for the next four years? And so in speaking with people, I realized that the strategic planning should be a guide which is from the entire city, but also for the entire city. But there's a caveat to that. And the caveat is that We've all gone door to door. We've all heard unlimited demands, but we have limited resources. So the key here is that we have to go out in such a way and say to the public, if you could only pick five or six of those priorities, because we only have so much money and so much time, what would those priorities be to you? And then we can funnel that information and craft our strategic plan from that. So I'm happy to support this recommendation. It actually alleviates pretty much all the concerns that I had with the process and allows us to get into a room together and then craft and nail down those priorities with input from the public uh, and basically focus on what those priorities are because at the end of the day, it is taxpayers' money and we're all taxpayers. So it should be information from everybody. Something else that possibly we could look at in the future would essentially be having the public get feedback on how they think we're doing on those priorities. So that would be kind of a feed-in feedback loop. And I think that would be, you know, maybe at the two-year mark, we could say, hey, you helped us pick our priorities. How are we doing? So in my mind, this is a great recommendation. Or sorry, amendment. I'd like to thank the mayor and, and Councillor Neal for bringing this forward. And I really hope the public takes this opportunity to engage on this because you're helping us craft the way the city's going for the next four years. So please take the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. And Councillor Bohm, would you pick, take the chair so I can make my comments as, as uh, yes, my, Deputy as Mayor Stroud, and I recognize you. you. Thank you. So it looks like this uh, amendment has, has pretty broad support in this room, and that's uh, that's great. It's great when there's a, a broad support for anything here. Uh, I just want to make it clear what this amendment does and maybe what it doesn't do. So it, it is talking about extra public engagement before we start the strategic planning process and I think we, we probably all agree that that's a good thing and for that reason perhaps the amendment is a great way to, to get to that public engagement piece. But there's other aspects of the strategic plan that are not part of this amendment that are not addressed by this amendment. Uh, for example, whatever we come up with in the strategic plan, and we, I learned this from experience the first time, uh, it goes into a, a nice looking uh, document, strategic plan, and the last time it was 2015 to 2018, and it had six priorities, they all sounded great. It, I sort of use the analogy of a really nice fancy restaurant menu, where there's six different uh, types of dishes, and then you had a sub, under the each heading, you had sub, Subheading, so different dishes, different fish dishes, different vegetarian dishes or whatever. So this menu that we created was really nice looking and it also had all of our ideas in it. So it, with another thing that was great about it is that all of uh, us from that term who brought ideas to the strategic planning session got them into the menu. But following on with the menu, menu uh, analogy, the menu uh, after four years, there was no way of actually knowing for sure which items on the menu had actually been completed and which were still just sort of sitting on the menu and never been ordered or never had actually happened so, or, or had only just barely started, right? If you go back, you, we might have difference of opinion about how far we got on each of the initiatives, but there was no taking stock of it. So this amendment does not speak to that. How do we measure the result of the strategic planning session that we end up having? We're all agreed we're gonna have one. We can uh, add this public piece, but how do we assess uh, its effectiveness at the end of term? We did not do that last term. 
So that's uh, something I just want to point out uh, as we debate this amendment that you might think that it ends there, but when we come back to the main motion, that we, there may be more things to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor, and I return the chair. Okay, does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Councillor Hutchison. Yes, I just want to make a small contribution, and that is hopefully when the online survey is done, as part of it, will be just what Councillor Bonser referred to, is what is this process supposed to achieve and why are we doing it? Because strategic planning isn't at top of mind with lots of people who may be interested in what's happening in their city. The same thing about the public meeting. We sometimes have meetings where there's placards put up and all that sort of thing. People come and maybe they talk to a staff member and they go away satisfied, but maybe not. And it seems to me that we, what I would encourage is that there's an introduction to what's happening here, why you're going to see these placards, why we're presumably the vast majority of us, some people who might be working or something, will be there, and why we're putting so much stock in this and giving you access that, frankly, we've never done before, by the degree of access, anyway. Uh, and um, so I just think a small, you know, relatively brief introduction of why this is important, what we want from you, and, and how we intend to use it. That doesn't mean everything you say is going to turn up on the final list. I think we have to be clear with people because in the end, we're the elected representatives and we have to sift it out. Some of it will, of course, I would hope. But I think we need to be really clear about all of that. Because what people think, and sometimes this happens in the planning process, is you know they come in, they give their input, and then they don't see any effectual uh, result in, in what is decided to be done. I think we have to try and close that gap. It can't always be one and one try to close that gap. So if we can do that, I think it would be better. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillors wish to speak? Councillor Hill. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I, uh, I also support this amendment. I, I think, though, that uh, it's a little bit like a, a job interview in a way. You know, the culmination of your job interview is that uh, half an hour, 45 minute interview. Uh, and it can't ignore the body of work that you've already done. And the body of work that we've been doing uh, really re re revolves around the election. The campaigning that we, we did, that what we heard uh, at each of our constituents' doors as we knocked on it. I would hate to see a situation where, and I think I, I'm completely open to the notion of, of having more public input into this, and the more that we can have, the better. But we learned a lot in those uh, trips uh, to each uh, uh, constituent store and I think that information uh, that we uh, that we drew from that experience is going to be uh, extremely valuable and it really is a voice for everyone because typically uh, when these surveys go out and when uh, you hold a public uh, a meeting you, you get a very small portion of the population that attends or responds uh, typically they tend to be uh, more interest driven groups so, and that's wonderful, we want that. We uh, hope for that kind of input from folks. But we did learn a lot in our travels around the uh, city in the last couple months, and I think they really should form the backbone. I know, certainly, I, I believe I know what the priorities of Lakeside District are, and I suspect the other councillors around the Horseshoe have a similar feeling about their experience in their own uh, district. So uh, that should weigh uh, uh, a considerable uh, amount as we, can, you know, we consider what our priorities are. And I certainly agree with the, what was said by uh, Councillor Stroud, that uh, or Deputy Mayor Stroud, that the uh, the document isn't complete unless it's also measurable. We have to be able to ensure that uh, that we can assess how we're doing, uh, and that it is a living document that continues through the course of the term of this council, uh, and that there's opportunities for us to go back and assess how well we're doing at it. In fact, when I, when I looked at uh, what was accomplished in the last council. I, uh, I, I have to say I'm in a bit of awe of what, what got done. It was amazing. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, that the incorporation of these additional uh, elements to this uh, process and the consideration for what we've already uh, been told in our, in our uh, districts, along with some 
changes in the process and ensuring it's a living document will make sure that this works for all of our community. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you. There are a couple of councillors that haven't spoken, but uh, this is your last chance. All right, so we will call the vote on the amendment, as it is up there, to Clause 4. Please vote. That passes unanimously, and I return the chair, Your Worship, and I also remind you that I would wish to speak. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, before you return the chair, if I have a couple of minutes left on the clock, can I say just a couple of last? So you, you're speaking to the amendment again? No. Oh, no, so you're back to, uh, that's right, it was your turn to speak. I'll give you three more minutes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. I won't need that much time. <laughs> So, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, thank you to Council for your support on the uh, amendment. Uh, I do want to echo what uh, Councillor Hill has said. We likely will not get 33,000 people uh, submitting input into this additional consultation like we did during the election. Uh, so we're going to have to keep that in mind. But again, I think it's always helpful uh, to give people extra opportunity to be able to, to raise issues and concerns with us. So I look forward to, to that input. The only other thing that I wanted to say was just in relation to the comment that was made earlier about uh, the subsequent implementation. Um, certainly that is something that we will want to discuss once we've developed our priorities, but I, I do want to remind uh, Council, now some of us have been here for four years, that every quarter uh, staff bring to us what's called a priority matrix. Uh, to help us to keep track of where is the progress on every single item that we are currently working on. So I simply throw that out there to say that if that is a process that is not working for people, uh, certainly that is something that we can discuss when the strategic planning is completed and all of it comes back to council for formal approval, perhaps that, that would be a, a good time for us to discuss then what is, what are the measurables, are there ways that we want to change how we track that, that progress. So I think that that's, uh, that's an excellent point and uh, certainly look forward to, uh, to getting through to that, to that stage. Thank you very much. You still had 90 seconds, but... Uh, I'm good. I will I'm return good. the chair. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we are back to the... Um, Clause as amended. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Yes, Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thank you. So, um, so just also to build on my earlier comments uh, to the amendment. So basically, we all agree that to the basic format of it, which is we get together, we have a brainstorming session of sorts, very intense, with a facilitator. We get as many uh, priorities in there as possible and then it goes to staff and then staff is in charge of implementing it. Well, somebody has to implement it. I guess that's what staff's for. Uh, however, uh, in the last session, I was not satisfied with the transparency of the whole process and especially with the what became of priority number six, which was open government. I think uh, those from the last council will remember that that was a priority for many of us during the strategic planning session, that's why it was one of the six priorities, and yet we didn't, we can't really honestly say we made a lot of progress towards true open government in the last term. What we got was a lot, we got some more engagement, yes, from members of the public, but open government means that things are done transparently. And when the strategic plan itself is not transparent, we've got a problem. So, uh, as you can tell, there's more than just the measurables. There's the, tra there's the uh, how do we know that our priorities, even if they're, if it, it, it seems like a sort of promise when it's in the uh, document, the, the strategic plan document, and it looks really good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it comes true. And so that is really where I want to focus uh, my comments and my solutions. So Unfortunately, I don't think five minutes per council, we just spent, uh, each of us, we had, uh, almost all of us spoke to the amendment. And I hear there's another uh, six amendments uh, bouncing around, possibly to this, to this clause. So I really think that we don't really, uh, we're not prepared to get into the pros and cons of all of those amendments on the fly tonight. 
And I would, I would propose that we move into committee. Now, there's different ways you could do it. You go to committee of the whole on a, on a special council meeting, or we can send it to a, one of our umbrella committees. And that's what I've done. I've prepared a deferral for that reason. So if you can just, uh, uh, I've sent it to the clerks. I have a motion to defer, and I'm looking for a seconder. Uh, let me just say before I make the motion to defer, that this is not like some deferral motions, does not involve any extra time. Like it doesn't change the timelines. It's right in the motion uh, that, that the timelines stay the same. This is an extra step before the strategic planning session happens to be able to get members of the public at a, in a committee setting. It's, not, it, it's complementary to the previous amendment. It's not, it's not contradictory. But also, most importantly, to, for us to have the discussion about all that, there's six amendments possibly to be discussed tonight. I think we'd rather do that in a committee setting where there's unlimited number of uh, people can speak. All members can come ex officio, the mayor and, and any other councillors that aren't on the committee. So this is really just another way to add value to the process. It's not deferring to slow things down or to make us miss our deadlines or anything like that. So with that said, um, I will read, or I guess it gets read out by the clerk once it's up, or I forget how that works with the deferral. So, And it, it has a date on it as well. Okay. So if we can post that motion to, to defer, please, so that I can, I can yeah. see it. Yes. Councillor Sanek. So it's seconded by Councillor Sanek. You'll see it coming up in a sec. Okay. So we have a motion to defer. Moved by Deputy Mayor Stroud, seconded by Councillor Osanek. The clause four of report number seven. Be you should say ad, as amended now, I guess. Okay, clause four of report number seven be deferred to a special administrative policies committee meeting on January the 17th, 2019 at 5.30 p.m. in order for members of the public to have the opportunity to address the committee and for councillors to have time to carefully consider all the details required for an effective strategic planning session with the intent of receiving a report from the committee and then going ahead with said session as suggested on March 28th and 29th, 2019. Okay, so we have a motion to defer that it is on the floor. Debate is with respect to time or place. Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. This is uh, with respect to time and probably directed at staff. Would this not, in essence, delay the start of all the other consultation and kind of start eating up that time while we waited to do this? Commissioner Hurdle? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I, I guess I, I will give this a try, although this is obviously new to me, so I'm just trying to process the information here. Um, we, the consultation that's been identified or engagement through the amendment that was supported talked about the survey online and people being able to submit something on online. We would probably be looking at starting something in January and running in, until February as far as that process is concerned to give people as much time as possible. Um, so I, I'm not sure if something was to come out of this committee and then make it to council because I, I'm assuming that all members of council would want to be involved ultimately. Um, that uh, the time frame there uh, could definitely delay what we would want to put online and start the process online. Okay, thank you. Councillor Neal? Yes, and I uh, am going to try to stay focused on time and place. I guess I'm a little concerned that we've had a thorough conversation. Point of order. Point of order. It's time and place only, time and place only. There's okay. no latitude, just do time and place. Okay. So that, I, that, that was uh, not necessary, Deputy Mayor. So time, time and place, Councillor Neal? Okay. Uh, the, well, I cannot support delegating this uh, anywhere except to council because we've, it's, it should be a full council decision. So that is with respect to place, so that in my view, is a, is a fair comment, whether or not you agree with that or not. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and I recognize you. Time and place. 
Thank you. So with respect to time, again, my concern is that this will, uh, will push back the, the very public consultation that we wanted to add to this process with respect to place, I too believe that this is a discussion for council. Because if administrative policies discusses this, then it will come back to council and we will be back in the same position a month from now having exactly the same discussion. So it's better that we discuss it now. Thank you. If I could have the chair back. You have the chair back. Thank you very much. Anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Holt. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yes, regarding place, the Administrative Policies Committee has yet to meet in its new form, and that would be the first meeting of that committee. So again, I am, I would suggest that the, the place is inappropriate, um, both in terms of the mandate of that committee and in terms of the needs of this clause. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to time or place? Councillor Hill? I really just want to echo what Councillor Holland said. I think that the, uh, that, that, that this will really delay the process, and there's six councillors that have been policies, and there's 12 here. I think this is the time to discuss it. Councillor McLaren. Thank you. Just uh, with regards to place, the Administrative Policies Committee is the only legal place that we could actually discuss this outside of council. The only reason we can decide it in council is because all of the administrative policy is here. Um, so to say that uh, administrative policy is not the proper place. It is a proper place. With regards to time, I seem to have heard the uh, deputy CAO say that there was going to be a survey that needed to be timed with this. Um, may I ask if how long that survey would take, or how long that survey is planned to be delivered if we were not uh, with the original motion? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So, uh, you know, bear in mind that uh, this is all information that's coming out tonight, so it's not uh, like I had quite a lot of time to prepared for, for this. Um, but based on comments that were made earlier around public engagement, I think that we would want to look at starting something online, whether it's written submissions that people want to provide or responding to a survey somewhere around late January and extend that into late February to provide people as much time as possible to be able to, to respond. So looking at a January 17 uh, committee date would mean most likely that a recommendation from that committee would come to council on February 5th and depending on what the direction at that point might be, we would have started a process that could be potentially impacted by the outcome of the committee and uh, council members' decision. So if I understood that correctly, it's a month-long process, late, late um, January to late February, and uh, it was going to be, uh, assuming this could happen, it would be returning in January, the first council meeting in January, but the special council meeting in, Jan in February is after that, so it strikes me that it quite it could still fit quite nicely and still do it so that we can have it inform strategic planning uh, in March. Okay, if there's, uh, yes, Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, the, the concern here I think is that the, the committee might be discussing additional steps around engagement uh, for the process because it will be inviting obviously the public to submit comments. And if there were changes to the direction that staff have already started to undertake based on the amendment that we've seen tonight, then uh, that could be a bit problematic as we would like to start the process around late January, again, to provide people as much time as possible. Okay, is there anybody else so, Deputy Mayor Stroud, it is your motion. You can speak last to it if there's nobody else who wishes to speak. You have the floor. Again, with respect Again, to time, to and, time place. and place. Time and place. Yeah, so just in respect to the comments about uh, over this. Look, this January 17th is next week. Next week, the comment about it not having met yet is valid. Uh, so the first thing that would have to happen would be election of officers because it would be the first one of this term. Uh, that doesn't, that only takes five minutes. Um, the, the intent of, 
the place being the uh, Administrative Policies Committee, if I wasn't clear earlier. So basically, it does say in the mandate of the, of the, of the Administrative Policies Committee that strategic planning is one of the things that you, that you might discuss. And everything in the committee's reports to council, that it's, it's, it's implied in the wording here, but receiving a report from the committee, that's council. Council receives a report from the committee. It would be at the very next council meeting after the committee report, after the committee is held. So if the committee meets on the 17th, it's the next council meeting after that. So it's the first meeting in February. The public engagement piece is ongoing until the end of February. This, it's complementary. It doesn't, it doesn't conflict. I understand the concerns that it conflicts, but I, I don't believe that that's a fact. And the, um, it was written basically the next possible time that we can meet nine days hence and uh, to be a parallel process uh, to have the uh, have the it to have the place is the committee to be able to discuss the uh, proposed changes that are coming from a council member at an appropriate place other than tonight thank you thank you so we will call the vote on the motion to defer please vote And that loses by a vote of four to nine. Deputy Mayor Stroud, you still have three minutes and 30 seconds on the clock. Thank you, Your Worship. And my computer is timed out. I do have uh, some notes on here, so just give me a sec. Uh, so basically, okay, so now the deferral has failed, so we have to, we're gonna deal with it tonight, and, that, and I thought that might happen. So I do have a, an amendment of my own, it's very short, and it links to what I said earlier about measurables. So basically, uh, the reason for this amendment is so that it is, so staff has direction that whether it's during the session or during the writing up of the final plan, the plan needs to include measurables. I think we can agree that the measurables are important. I've already spoken to that. I think you got that point. So I've got a, an amendment uh, that's seconded by Councilor McLaren that is to the point of, of objective measurables, and by objective I mean as opposed to subjective. So um, just that the, that the planning session results uh, also determine a set of objective measurables that can be used at the end of council term to determine success or failure of each strategic priority. So it's what I was talking about before. So basically, before I uh, give up the floor, it's just another clause to the current recommendation uh, that do doesn't conflict with any of the other clauses to add a, um, a process that would result in objective measurables for each strategic priority. So last time we had six strategic priorities, green the city, invest in infrastructure, open government, but we didn't have measurables for them, and then, then that's why the confusion about whether or not we got there. So that's, uh, it, it, and the mayor already spoke to this earlier as well, about it possibly being the best time for that might be after the document is crafted, uh, but that, that discussion needs to happen at the strategic planning session so that we know what to expect and that staff knows what to bring us back. So that's the purpose of the amendment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion on the floor. It's been moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Councillor McLaren. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to it? Yes, uh, Councillor McLaren. Thank you. The whole point of having measurables, of course, is to hold us accountable. If you believe that accountability is a virtue of government, then we should be held accountable by our metrics. Um, when I was on the KEDCO review committee uh, a few years ago, one of the big things that people were concerned about was the accountability of KEDCO and whether they had any measurables as to what they were doing. Having put that into KEDCO, it seems that it would be appropriate that we should also do that as well. Having accountable ability to look at something and say, did, were we successful and were we, or did we fail, is not meant to be... Um, uh, a life or death kind of thing. If you can imagine playing basketball and you throw a hoop shot and you miss, it's a failure. You learn from your mistakes, you improve, you go on for the next one. These failures are not supposed to be existential, you're fired if you fail, that kind of stuff. These are meant to say, we can improve. 
based on what we had last time. And if we can improve, that also means that we must be willing to risk failure. And by risking failure, we show a certain amount of maturity in that we can learn from our mistakes. So this is definitely one of uh, 12 points of improvement that I have, and uh, I hope that you will consider supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, uh, I think, first of all, I just want to make it clear to um, members of the public uh, and members of council who maybe aren't aware that the priority matrix um, is a measurement. It's perhaps not the measurement that we, are, that we find most useful, but I do think it's important um, to acknowledge the work that staff put into creating such a document, which is a form of measurement. Um, if it's not, and I agree to some extent, it is difficult to look at that document and figure out if enough work is happening on a priority that we, that we care a great deal about, then that's another issue. And, and I, I agree that it could be, um, there could be a different way of providing that information to council. But I do think we need to consider that the priority setting is the job of council, for sure. The strategic plan as a document is a work plan for staff. They may need to have um, a certain way of reporting on measurables on, on the, the priorities that illustrates how that work fits in with ongoing operations at the city. And so to suggest that that is, that there has not been a way of measuring success in the past, I find problematic with this amendment. Um, I think, on the other hand, that it's clear if members of the last term of council have, have felt that there were, that the type of information that was provided on where we ended up on a certain priority was um, not conducive, I guess, or com completely um, conclusive, then, then that's great and important work that we should be, be receiving. And I think um, that's a different measurement altogether. That's a way of saying, are measuring these priorities in relation to one another and saying, as we go forward over the next four years, are we seeing enough attention to each priority or are we seeing that some priorities seem to be, be progressing for some reason? Um, more than others. And there are all kinds of good reasons why that is the case and has been the case. Um, so I'm, I am okay with receiving some, some other reporting uh, report or form of report on success, but I'm not comfortable supporting this amendment. Thank you. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, I, th I think we may be in an instance here of putting the cart before the horse because I know most of us spoke earlier about having some type of measurable, having some type of feedback, and I think everybody around this table is carrying that theme with them as we go into strategic planning. So I'm always concerned sometimes with these motions when we're trying to predict what's going to happen and then sort of set the stage for that, that we may in essence hamstring ourselves because in my mind right now, Although there's probably only maybe 20 to 25 words up there, that to me right now raises more questions than answers. And some of those are measurable. Okay, great. By whom? Us, the public, staff. Where does that come in? What does the, what does the actual measurable thing look like? What are the objectives? How do we get there? Uh, Councillor Holland mentioned that we have the priority matrix. Maybe that's great. Maybe it's not. Maybe we need to build on that. Maybe we need to have feedback from all councillors. Maybe two years in, councillors can have a survey to say, how do you think we're doing on the priorities? Maybe the public can have that survey. Maybe staff can provide more information as to what priorities are going to be prioritized over others as we move forward. So although I agree with the intent in a sense, which is to build this in. I can't support this motion because I think we need to have the higher level conversation to say what's the plan look like to really understand what are the measurables gonna look like and then to figure out as a council, 
all 13 of us together in the strategic planning sessions, now that we know what the plan is, how are we gonna measure it? Objectively, subjectively, what type of feedback, what's it gonna look like? And to really craft that document, I think we need to actually have that conversation first, which is why I understand where the motion is coming from, but I don't think this is the right time to make this decision. So I will be voting against it, thank you. Councillor Neal. Point of order, Thank if I you. may. Point of order. Um, a few questions were asked, and it seems that we could answer them. So if, if there's a question asked, it would be to the mover. But I do not believe that those were questions, those were comments. So, but absolutely, if somebody has a question for the mover, then that absolutely is in order. Councillor Neal. Thank you. Um, I'm going to support the motion because I think the intent is right. And the example that was used uh, by the mover um, I share in some of that same frustration around uh, the whole idea of transparency and and uh, open government. And I think I recall getting myself in trouble for doing that publicly uh, in the past. So I, I also agree. The only thing about this motion that I'm a little bit concerned about is the term objective measurables. Uh, not everything that counts can be counted. And sometimes we try to, we craft uh, measurables when actually a judgment of whether uh, something has been successfully fulfilled maybe can't be counted, can't be measured. And so, uh, so, uh, for that reason, I, that's my only hesitation with this uh, amendment, but I, I will support it because I think having that final review of how, how we did is, is a good idea. I do want to remind people that every time we get a quarterly report, uh, every time we get a report, it's up to council to be vigilant about whether we're, we're succeeding. So it's, it's unfortunate if at the end of a term we complain about not fulfilling a priority because it's up to us for four years to remind staff that these are our priorities. So, but I will be supporting the motion. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair, Your Worship, and you have the floor. Thank you. So I agree with Councillor Neal's comment about the intent, and we had that discussion earlier. So I'm absolutely supportive of having this discussion. My problem with this amendment is that it suggests that that discussion happens right at the strategic planning session. Now, earlier we made reference to what had happened with the KEDCO review. The KEDCO review happened and the discussion on measurables has taken a year and a half since. Because finding the right measurable is hard. The only thing worse than not having measurables is having the wrong measurables. So it is absolutely foolish for us to go immediately and rush into a discussion around measurable. If we get the wrong one, we're going to be in big trouble. The second piece that I think is absolutely critical on this is that the strategic planning session is council and only council. The CAO is there, and I think that that's important. But the discussion around implementation and setting uh, measurables, that has to be a dialogue between council and staff. We do not have the ability or the expertise or the on-the-ground understanding to be able to just pick some uh, measurables out of the air and then task staff to go and do that without understanding what would be the impact to the overall workflow of the organization. So I would absolutely support this discussion in its right time. So I would suggest we'll go through strategic planning, we'll come up with our priorities, it will have to come back to council, and then let's talk about what are, the, what are the ways we're going to gauge that process? If the priority matrix is not working for people, then I think absolutely we can have that discussion, but that would be the time to do it. So that's why I can't support this motion to amend, um, but I will support a discussion that happens later on in the process. Thank you. Thank you, and I return the chair. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson, and through you, 
In fact, my comments are very similar to yours. Um, I wonder about the professional feasibility of us as a council body to set objective measures that are worthwhile and that don't hamstring us into um, a particular direction that could turn out to be problematic, uh, given our limitations and inability to draw on staff. If I'm reading this motion correctly, or this amendment correctly, it'd be us making those decisions at that time. Which brings me to my second reservation, which is, do we have the time? And that's a direct question to the mover. Would we have the amount of time we need to even come up with some of these measurements? Yeah, I, I, to answer that question, it, 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 which is very valid, and it's been spoken to by three different council members at, at this point. Um, the, the intent of the amendment was not to be super narrow. It was to, uh, to make clear to staff that we require measurables and if we can have that discussion at the strategic planning session, it doesn't necessarily have to result in the specific metrics. It only needs to result in a set of, in the fact that there's going to be a set of measurables included in the plan. That's maybe not clear from the short wording on the screen. No. The, if we are, the, I've been through the process. And we talk about the priorities, and then and then and the process sort of it morphs along, and uh, you know, and you end up with uh, groups of priorities. In this case, we had six six headings, like I said before. So, what it didn't have, though, was a way to go back and measure them from that from that session, or what kind of measurables, what kind of metrics we'd be looking at. So, even if it's not, if it's true that it's not possible to do so at the uh, time of the strategic priority setting, the measurables need to be part of the conversation in some way. Well, that's, that's the intent of the amendment. Thank you for the response and through you, Mayor Patterson. I completely agree with the intent and the response is agreeable to me as well, but I might respectfully suggest that that is not captured in the wording before us. Okay, next on my list is Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I, I think it, I, what, I, I definitely agree with the notion of having measurables as part of this process and at the end of the day that we need to have that and we need to be able to assess uh, how well we've done. But I think what we have to be careful about is sort of the, uh, the, the term failure because I don't think the fact that an initiative is not achieved uh, is evidence necessarily of failure. It's a living document. Uh, it's sort of our collective opportunity to review what we've accomplished uh, and what we think we can accomplish and to use the process uh, of establishing the priorities as we're going to be doing uh, to rededicate ourselves to uh, completing whatever the last council did not, was not able to achieve. So, for example, one of the things that I heard was that the uh, affordable housing issue didn't get the attention that it should have with the last council and then the uh, priorities. Uh, be, uh, because I think it was uh, the reference in the, in the uh, matrix was that it, we would continue to follow the 10 year plan. Well, clearly I, uh, from what I've heard around the, 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 the horseshoe, uh, affordable housing has moved considerably up that uh, list of, of, of our priorities. I certainly agree that we need to measure it. Uh, I do uh, agree with, the, with uh, what the mayor has said in terms of incorporating that into the process as we develop the priorities. Uh, uh, and I'm uncomfortable with the term failure in this motion. So although I do support the notion of measurables, I, I cannot support this particular uh, motion. Amendment, sorry. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak to the amendment? Councillor Hutchison. <clears throat> I'm going to give this a shot. What I hear is we think we should have measurables. I also heard some good points about how we have a priority matrix and that sort of tells you how things are moving along in a sort of generalized sort of way, but that's not satisfying. Um, I also, just to make a point, it's because very clear to me that we need to, when we get our priorities, we need to be more precise about the ones we think are the most important perhaps. That's hard to do because the city has, I think the CAO once said to me, we're into 73 different businesses. And somebody's affected by 
probably three dozen of them, right? So anyway, this is gonna, this is gonna be my, my attempt, if I can get a secondary, that we, we amend this. We don't have to take it just as it is, right? That we amend this, that this 2019 strategic planning session include a discussion of, we don't need the word objective, measurables that can be used at the end of council term to determine the status of each strategic priority. Okay, so. And Councillor Holland said she'll second. Okay, so Councillor Tristan's put forward an amendment to the amendment. Can we have that in, can we have that in writing, please? Yeah. We will, we will pause for a moment. Or you put that in writing. Okay. Uh, so I think we have the um, amendment to the amendment ready to go. Can I just ask, uh, Madam Deputy Clerk, if you could read that for us? Okay, the, uh, the amendment to this amendment has been moved by Councillor Hutchison and seconded by Councillor Holland. The amendment is that uh, the words determine a set of objective measurables that can be used at the end of council term to determine success or failure of each strategic priority be deleted and insert in its place discuss a set of measurables that can be used to determine the status of each strategic priority. Okay, so um, is there anyone that wishes to speak to the amendment to the amendment? Councillor Bohm? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I think this is uh, fine. It's pretty much what we've been discussing all night, and I think this is naturally going to happen anyways, so let's hopefully I'll just support it and we can move on with the agenda tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Councillor Chappelle? I press the wrong button again. I'd like to call a question. Okay, so I need a mover, need a seconder for the call to question. Deputy Mayor Stroud. Okay, so this will require two thirds to pass. Okay, this is a motion to call the question, and this is on the amendment to the amendment. Please vote. And that carries. So now we will immediately call the question on the amendment to the amendment. Please vote. That carries by a vote of 12 to 1. Deputy Mayor Stroud, you have the floor. You have one minute and 45 seconds on the clock. Okay, I'm just going to finish by uh, a little pep talk, I guess, to the four new members of the council that didn't go through this four years ago. Um, start preparing now. Uh, make use of all the public engagement that we do set up and the feedback we get back as a, as a starting point. I mean, uh, Councillor Hill, go back to your notes from your campaign about what your constituents are asking you. Try to uh, write it as, as uh, uh, take a look at the current strategic document and the way it's worded with, uh, with sort of headings and, and names of the various initiatives and try to put it thing, uh, put things, ideas in point form on little po um, post-it notes or index cards is what I use an index card. Actually, I still have it in my office as a reminder. Basically, it's the idea of boiling down all the most important things that you need to do for your constituents in, onto, a, onto an index card and bring that with you to the strategic planning session, uh, which will help start the ball rolling for when we, uh, when we do the exercise. And you'll be amazed at uh, how much ground gets covered in that exercise, but uh, really need to be prepared and so then you can't look back in anger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and my apologies. So procedurally, we voted on the amendment to the amendment, but we did not vote on the motion as amended. So if we can now call the vote. So this would be on the amended amendment. Is everyone clear on that? 
So, so to be clear, we called the vote on the amendment to the amendment. So now we have an amendment that has been amended, and now we must vote on the amendment that has been amended, and then we will be back to the original clause as amended. Okay, so with that, we will call the vote on the motion as amended, please. What, what's up on the screen there? So this would yeah. be the, now the corrected version. So we have voted to delete what has been struck out and to add what is in red, but now we have to actually vote on the amendment itself. Please vote. And that carries. So now we are back to the clause as amended. On my speakers list, Councillor Neal, myself, and Councillor Stroud have spoken. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor McLaren. And just to clarify, now we're talking about the entire report's recommendation as amended. Is that That's correct? Right. Okay. Right. All right. So as I was going over this report, um, there were at least 12 points that I had certain concerns with, and six of them uh, I felt could be major points of improvement. Uh, several of them have already been done, the low-hanging fruit, the asking for more public consultation and getting some measurables in there as well. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, the remainder that I've got as points of improvement and hope that um, I'll be convincing. I'd also like to say just before we start that uh, if I'm not... If I get uh, the sense that, if I give you the sense that there's something that might be available to be fixed here, um, and you don't like my wording, but you like the principle, feel free to amend. I'm not committed 100% to the actual text here as long as we improve. The whole point of what I'm about to say is meant to um, level us up, move us up to a more um, contemporary form of, of strategic planning. So, as a point of improvement, the first one that I'd like to talk about is what I noticed last time was that after our democracy, we took those posted notes and a report came out a few weeks later at the next council meeting that changed the actual text of the democracy. And then, several months later, when the colored brochure this one came out. That text was also changed. Now, Your Worship, you mentioned earlier how we spent a huge amount of time wordsmithing. All of that time was wasted when the text was changed. So that strikes me as a point of improvement. And uh, the case that I've given out to most of you guys, I think, who have seen this is the uh, affordable housing. We committed in the last strategic plan to create affordable housing. What ended up in the original and the final text was to continue the status quo. Part of that disconnect is why we have a problem today. So in order to have uh, this be led by council and not necessarily change behind closed doors, to have transparency, to have accountability in actual text, I would like that the actual text at the end, what we wordsmith, what we talk about formally, because we spent a lot of time on that wordsmithing, be, um, be static unless we change it in public. It should not be changed behind closed doors. It should not be changed in secret. And that's the nature of this first motion. So if, Mr. Clerk, I believe I gave you a whole bunch, this one would be the one labeled six. It could be put up, and if I have a seconder, I believe Councillor Osanic agreed to this, but she's busy. Okay, so... You want me to read it while it's looking for it? So, therefore, it be resolved that the staff recommendation in Report 19-027 be amended by adding the following that clause. That Council approve, by motion, the complete final text coming out of the strategic planning session and that this text not be altered without public Council amendment. The idea being that if we wordsmith something, we'd like that text to stick. 
And if we want to change it, we're free to change it in public, not in secret. If that sounds reasonable, I hope you will consider the amendment. <laughs> I have the chair, so I guess I have to give it away. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair, Your Worship, wrong one. and you have the floor. Point of order, okay, it's so the wrong point, one point on of the order, top. So we have a motion that's moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor McClaren. It's the wrong one. Okay, so it should be moved by Councillor McClaren, seconded by Councillor Hutchison? Uh, well, okay, if he wants to. I, Lisa agreed, but fair enough. Oh, okay. Fine. So if we can just change that to moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Um, so, the, so it's a motion moved by Councillor McLaren, second by Councillor Hutchison, and your worship is commenting on the motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So, four years ago, we had one night where we put all the ideas up on the board. Then we had a second night where we did wordsmithing. The CAO was in the room. We made sure that everything was good and we were comfortable with it. Then after that, it came to council. And council had to vote to approve it. So I am deeply troubled by the suggestion that wording was changed without council's approval when council approved what had actually come out of the, the strategic planning session. And if council didn't like that, then council should have amended it at that point. So I see no reason why we need to say some, I guess my concern with something like this is it implies that something was somehow done incorrectly in the previous iteration of this, and I just, I just strongly disagree with that. I do. So that's why I'm, I'm gonna not support this motion to amend. But that being said, of course, we can make sure that when the wording comes back to council, if we're uncomfortable with the wording, absolutely, we can wordsmith away again if we need to. Um, again, the process four years ago, council had to sign off on everything, and that's exactly what will happen again this particular time. Thank you. And I return the chair. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the motion to amend? Councilor Bohm? Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I basically just wanted to kind of echo your comments there, is that we did go through that strategic planning process and the democracy, and a lot of those words that were put up there were 13 distinct priorities and then summarized and came back, and then we had a chance when it came to council to change that wording. So again, just to reiterate, we accepted that as a council, so we accepted that wording as a council. So if we're looking back four years now, deciding that what we did at the time needed improvement, well, hindsight is always gonna be 2020. But in this case, I think there are some concerns that were raised and there are things we can do throughout the strategic planning process to wordsmith, we can spend a whole night wordsmithing, heck, we can spend a whole week wordsmithing, but at the end of the day, this time we're gonna accept a final document and it hopefully will be uh, to everybody's liking and the words we can play around with them until we get them exactly perfect. But we can't four years from now go back and say, oh, well, we didn't get that chance. So, I mean, we had the chance last time, we're gonna have the chance this time. So, I mean, some of these motions tonight are becoming redundant, I think, until we've gone through the process. So I'm gonna be voting against this as well. Thank you. Councilor Neal. Just very quickly, I, I'm going to support the motion, but I, in, and four years is a long time, especially when you get as old as I am. Uh, so four years ago, I remember this process, and frankly, I agree. I think when the final iteration of the wording came forward to council, it was approved uh, in public council. So this motion is asking us to do what we should be doing. And so therefore, I can support it, but I don't, 
I don't think that it was altered. I mean, it was, the layout wasn't the way that, I mean, God forbid if we have a committee of 13 of us that decide how to publish and, and lay out uh, a strategic plan, it would be uh, a troubling document, I'm sure. But the wording itself reflected, I think, what uh, came out of the strategic planning. All of the items were intended to have equal value, and I've shared with some of my colleagues that I'm not sure that was always the case, uh, which was troubling. But that, again, is up to council to be vigilant about those kinds of things and not, uh, and not uh, four years later to uh, complain that things were changed when in fact the wording did, I think, and I'm looking to the eight of us that were here then, I think the wording did uh, reflect the, professionally reflect the, uh, the discussions that took place, so. Okay, thank you. Next on my list is Councilor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Through you, as a new member of council, two quick uh, administrative logistical questions. When the strategic plan comes back to council to be accepted, does it come with any minutes that were taken during those sessions? To your worship, um, the minutes uh, that come out of the uh, strategic planning session are pretty much bare bone minutes. It's the direction that we provide the CAO to come back with a report based on the uh, dot matrix exercise and whatnot is that what comes back to council in the form of a staff report. So the minutes are not um, uh, quite fulsome at that point. Follow up to that, in that staff report, is there any indication of how the priorities were ranked within the strategic planning session? Do you worship, that's a great question, and the short answer is yes. Councillor Kiley, you still have the floor if there's anything else you want to say or is it just to ask those questions? That's fine, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. I have an example from the last document, from the report that the clerk just mentioned. So it's all coming back to me now. So in, in June of 2015, we got a report from the CAO, which was the direction of the motion that the, that the clerk just mentioned, uh, that put the meat on the bones, uh, so to speak. And on the item affordable housing, which was a high priority then, it may be a higher priority now, but it was a high priority then, there was wording about that, Councilor Osanic has found it in the report. Um, in the past few years, I'm quoting the report of the CAO from June 2015. In the past few years, the city has been allocating two million per year for the development of new affordable housing. Unlike social housing, affordable housing is defined as units that are 80% of market rent as established by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation, and it goes on. So that's a measurable, and that's in the report from the CAO, and it's specific, but that's, a, that's like a promise and not an action, right? So this is to the point of the measurables, but it's also to the point of the amendment. So the amendment is saying the wording needs to match what we agreed on the night of. And of course, the comments by Councillor Bowman, by your worship, are, are true. We do approve the wording in open session. So this amendment is, in fact, moot. But it's not, it's not so much redundant, it's moot. Uh, so it really doesn't matter if it passes or fails. Is, is, if it fails, then those who are concerned about whether or not it's being followed or whether or not it's happening need to be vigilant at the time when we have that vote. And if it passes, well, then we've got a, like a second layer of direction to staff that we're going to want the wording to match. It doesn't really, to me, it doesn't really matter. I'm going to support the amendment because I think the intention is good, but I agree that it really won't change anything. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor McLaren, you have the last word. 
thank you. Now, the reason that this was approved uh, in its final way is because it had already been printed. How much money would we be wasting if we had thrown it out? It came to us printed in order to be approved. That is part of the problem. Had it come out in a simple report, something like this, which we all agreed to create affordable housing, it would have been acceptable. Then it was changed and it was printed. And how many, may I ask, how many of these were ever printed? Commissioner Hurdle? Through you, Mr. Mayor, I don't have the number of printed copies from uh, 2015. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't bring that information tonight with me. I suspect it would have been a fair amount of money. And with that kind of pressure, imagine, you're sitting around council, you have a, you have a, a concern about one of the, the things that, it's not what we promised, it's not what we talked about. There's already a huge printing out, they're already being distributed or on the verge of being distributed. That's a type of um, censorship so almost. It's point, a type of- Point uh, of privilege, yeah. and I, I'm just gonna say this. I think that that is implying a motive to staff that is, quite frankly, unprofessional. And quite frankly, knowing that the document was initially in draft approved by council, I understand your your point, I'm not trying to make a bigger issue of this, but I would ask you please refrain from implying that staff had somehow done something that they weren't supposed to do. You can I am sorry, I did not mean to imply that staff had done anything they weren't supposed to. I am merely saying that the document changed and that we authorized it uh, in, in a way that was not helpful for the community. And the reason that we uh, approved it because it wasn't helpful for the community is due to um, concerns over co of the expense. That's entirely a governance issue. That's entirely a, sta uh, a council problem. Yes, if I had been stronger at that time, I probably would have brought it up. Um, it probably would have gone nowhere because of the expense. In order to avoid that in the future, I would like that the text, if it is going to be changed, to be changed by council and to, to be clear that it me, we want what comes out of strategic planning to stay the same unless we change it otherwise, not to be changed in, in, a, in a different way. And again, I'm not saying that staff did anything wrong. That's the procedure and the way that it was done in the past. I'm saying that we can become better by actually having a strategic plan that we agreed to at strategic planning session. In order to do that, I submit to you that this, that this motion will make things that much better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on the motion to amend, please. Please vote. And that loses by a vote of six to seven. Councilor McLaren, you still have one minute and 35 seconds on the clock. Thank you. So another point of improvement uh, speaks to the difference between management and governance. We are a governing board of the city of the corporation of the city of Kingston, and there's a firm separation of powers and of duties. We are supposed to have our noses in and our fingers out of management. That's the typical standard way of things. That division of labor and that separation of powers should go both ways. What I'm suggesting is that the governance, when we do governance and governance by itself, we should be in the lead. When we direct staff to do something and manage it and execute something, they're in the lead after we've given them direction. The staff report uh, speaks to the facilitator, an unelected hired uh, person who's very good at facilitating, but is 30 asked, seconds. Okay, may I have a little bit more time because I'm telling you that, okay. Councilor McLaren, I hold everybody to the same standard. 30 seconds. May I move a motion then that council resolve itself into the committee of the whole so that I can finish some of these points of improvement to improve the uh, strategic planning? Because it shouldn't be done flippantly. I have a motion here. Somebody so will second it. There is a motion to move into committee of the whole. Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment?
So we have a motion to move into Committee of the Whole. Is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Osanek. I just need a minute to confer with the clerk on one, one detail. Okay, thank you. Um, this requires a two-thirds majority to pass. Is there anybody that wishes to speak? Councillor Neal. Oh, hold on, it's my oh. motion. I'm sorry, I didn't realize that you wanted to speak to it. Councillor McLaren, you have the floor. Okay, so one of the limitations of this particular form of uh, meeting, a formalized meeting like this, is that there's no give and take. Uh, there's no ability to rebut, and uh, I know that in the last few sessions, in the last few motions that we've done, um, although it does take time, and this is part of the reason it might be best in a committee, but committee of the whole, um, it allows for clarification. So if, despite the fact that I may say something and it makes sense to me, it may not make sense the way I said it to others. So I heard a lot of misconstructions of what um, Councillor Stroud and what I've done in the past, or said in the past with regards to this. And the ability to, to communicate that is beneficial for strategic planning. It's beneficial because this is the, probably the most important thing that we have to do. And if we're gonna shut down communication because we're limited to a five minute rule, then we're not actually doing the best that we can do. We're settling for, okay, we've done three am amendments so far. We've improved it in three ways, but there's more that could be considered. And the whole point of this meeting um, or this report is to do the best. I mean, do we have a spirit of uh, continuous improvement? Do we want the best possibilities or not? Do we even want to discuss them? If you don't, then vote against this because you're essentially saying, we don't want to talk about this anymore. I'm suggesting to you that there's still a few other things that are concerns to me and I think a few others here whom I've talked to in the past about this. And if we're not going to talk about them, then this, isn't, this is more for show than for actually doing any good work. So I would ask that uh, we be allowed to go into the committee as a whole so that uh, some of these concerns can be addressed. And if it turns out that um, you don't value them, that's fine. But at least we're going to vote on them and, uh, and have a discussion on them instead of silencing them. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neal. Yes, thank you. Um, I've often supported the idea of committee of the whole. I think it gives council a more fulsome opportunity to speak to an issue, particularly a, a complex issue. In my dark and distant past back in, in the old city, we much more frequently had committee of the whole discussions on really complex issues. Uh, so I support the principle of doing that and I wish we did it and I've mentioned this to some of you I wish we did this more often having said that it feels a little awkward to request that we go into committee of the whole when you've been given the 30 second signal because each and every one of us at some point in time has found ourselves 
about to be timed out and we're frustrated because we have a lot more to say. Because I support, in principle, the idea of Committee of the Whole. I will vote in favor of this motion, but I, it'll be the last time I vote in favor of this motion if it isn't brought forward at the beginning of a debate and not at the end. And I'm uh, not trying to convince anybody to vote either way. But for that reason, I'm going to vote for it in principle. But it is awkward to bring it up at the end of your at at the end of a a motion process. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, I'm just going to take the devil's advocate uh, on this motion. And part of the reason is is I feel like we're already starting to try to get into strategic planning right here, right now, tonight. And to go into Committee of the Whole, you're going to get a lot of opinions. You're going to have a lot of discussion. You're going to go back and forth. And that's kind of the whole idea of strategic planning, is we can do all those things then and there. And then we approve the document. It'll come to us in draft. We can tweak it. We can wordsmith it. And at that point, we're also going to have, this time, an amended strategic planning where we're going to go out to the public. So if these concerns are out there in the public, I encourage people to send that in as part of your feedback. Let's get the feedback. Let's have the conversation. Let's involve everybody in these discussions before we decide to just start ad hoc strategic planning tonight by going into Committee of the Whole. So I'm going to vote against this. There's still other important things we need to get to on the agenda. Let's leave strategic planning for strategic planning. Let's get the feedback from the public first before we go into Committee of the Whole and start doing strategic planning. Thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Deputy Mayor Stover, do you take the chair? Take the chair, Your Worship, and I recognize you. Thank you. So I am well aware that I am the time cop when it comes to council meetings, and I try to be very fair and hold everybody to exactly the same standard. My concern with this motion, quite frankly, is precedent. So the reason why, for four years, we always abided by this rule was to enforce a discipline that you have five minutes, so you have to be very effective and efficient with your time. And if there are other things outside of that that you want to do, then you speak to your colleagues, you ask them to raise other concerns. There are different ways to work within the existing framework. Uh, but as Councillor Bohm says, there are a number of other things that are on our agenda tonight that we need to be able to get to. My other concern is that a number of the amendments that are coming forward talking about making sure that the text uh, can be approved, uh, making sure that we talk about measurables, these are not things that need to be dealt with in a formal council session with motions. We can talk about this stuff, and I would, I would certainly encourage members of council on those details to talk with staff and to talk with myself, because there's often ways where we can just say, hey, I've got an idea for the strategic planning session, can we also have a discussion on this? That's a very effective and collegial way of being able to, to, uh, to deal with these ideas. And when we do it in a formalized setting, it becomes very much you know, a battle royale politically. And so it, it tends to be divisive and creates tension. So I would just like to say to members of council as a whole, I think that there is a better way to do that. There's a reason why we have the structure we do. And so that's why I'm not going to support moving to committee of the whole. Thank you. If I could have the chair back. You've got the chair back. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councillor Kiley. I think earlier tonight and through you, Mr. Mayor, I heard that we agree around this horseshoe that strategic planning is perhaps the most important process that we'll undertake as a council because it sets direction for where we want to go in years to come and it really sets the tenor for the type of discourse we will have as a group. We also agreed earlier tonight, um, though it was a divided vote, that we would not move the discussion about the process of strategic planning to administrative policy. In fact, I voted to not do that and to have the discussion here tonight. Given the constraints and the precedent that Mayor Patterson has alluded to uh, of the five minutes, it is, in my estimation, uh, apparent that the timing of five minutes is not enough to fully discuss these issues. So because tonight we agreed that this is an extremely important issue, and because tonight we agreed that we would not do it in another context, I think it then becomes incumbent upon us to allow for the time that we need to make sure that this discussion <clears throat> 
discussion, excuse me, is as fulsome as it can be. So for that reason, I will be supporting the move to Committee of the Whole. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Stroud. Just to lay it on the line for those who haven't spoken or maybe have made up their minds, uh, we've heard both sides now. I'm not going to add to that debate, but I'm just going to sort of make a reality check. If you vote in favor of this, you're voting to prolong the debate for, for whatever, there's more than one reason, for whatever reason you like, and uh, deal with it tonight, which is consistent, as Councillor Kai said, with the uh, with, with those who voted against moving it to committee in the first place. And if you vote, if you vote in, against the motion to go to committee of the whole, it's because you want to speed things up. You want to just get to the end of this vote and then have it set. And I would submit that that is the reason for all these amendments in the first place, is that the last strategic planning session seemed rushed and seemed somewhat problematic in, in some way to those of us who went through it, even though, like I said before, the result was a really nice looking menu and nice color booklet that everybody liked when they saw it. Um, so if we really want to deal with all these uh, suggested problems, we have to do it tonight or we have to do it in committee and we've already voted against that. So I don't see how uh, we have very much wiggle room left, so I'm going to support. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hill. Thank you, Your Worship. I don't think it's as simple as we just want to get it done. I, I think that there are avenues, and as the Mayor has already suggested, there are going to be avenues for us to have these discussions throughout the, the process of strategic planning and the approval processes that follow. So I don't agree that, uh, that this is about just getting this done. I don't think that uh, this implies that we are trying to rush this exercise through. I think that this is a process tonight to get us to the process that's going to allow us to answer these questions. So I would not be supporting this motion. Okay, is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councilor McLaren, you have the floor. Thank you. So to, um, to deal with a few of the issues that were brought up, um, Your Worship, you suggested several strategies that I should do that in order to be saving more time, including talking to my fellow councillors, getting them to move certain things, that was done. I came to you also as saying that this is a very complicated thing and that I may need more than five minutes. Should we move into Committee of the Whole? You suggested, no, we don't need to do that, uh, that you would have enough time. I Clearly, I don't. Um, it was also suggested that uh, this is already sounding like, like strategic planning. Well, that's because we're dealing with the process of the strategic planning. In strategic planning, we will do strategic planning. This isn't strategic planning. This is the process to determine the process of strategic planning. And that subtle distinction means that it has to be done before we actually start the process. We have to agree on the process. And we need a little bit more time because there were problems that were identified in the last one, and we're trying to up the ante, make it better. So for that reason, let's discuss this. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we will call the vote to move into Committee of the Whole. And again, a reminder, it requires two-thirds to pass. Please vote. And that loses, and then it falls short of the two-thirds majority. Councilor McLaren, you do still have 30 seconds on the clock. Okay, I would like to move an amendment. Can I start the clock again, please? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. okay. So this amendment is based on the idea that um, governance should be done by, um, by the governing body as opposed to um, an unelected or un, uh, not even a staff member, a hired consultant. Um, reading the report, it seems that we are giving way too much power to this individual to, and I'm quoting from the report, assist in developing priorities. Like that's what we do for ourselves, right? to work with the CAO and, to, and team to design and facilitate three planning things. So it's proposed that it be managed by staff as opposed to led by council. That subtle difference is le leads to a managed report as opposed to a governance report. And further point that's in the report, and to lays uh, to establish an approach and agenda so to establish an approach and agenda. So we are delegating this, in a sense, to a non, 
governing body. That is separate. That is mixing the separation of of um, governance and management. So the the uh, could you put up number two, please? The one that's labeled number two. So the point of this particular one is that we, I would suggest that we would want the facilitator to facilitate, but not to do our job for us. If we're going to delegate our job to the facilitator, then what are we here for except for show? That's the essence of this one. And is that the one? Yes, that's the one. Thank you. So as I go over this that the chosen facilitator will facilitate the strategic planning priority setting process. But I want to distinguish the difference between facilitating and the other things that are properly the governance committee's role. We should be developing our priorities, not the, not the, um, not the non-governing bodies. We should be designing the planning session. We should be establishing the approach and the agenda because it's a governance thing. To mix the two is to do the inverse of sticking the noses in and fingers out. And again, not to roll up the, the session results, that's our job, instead of staff's job. And I would invite any questions, because I understand that this is a difficult one to comprehend. Um, I've, I've had a few conversations with a few of you, and it's been long. So if you do have questions, instead of um, presuming that you understand what I'm trying to say, work with me and try and either amend it to make it better or ask more questions, more follow-up questions, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilor Bohm. Thank you, Worship, and through you. I just want to try to understand the intent of this because it, I believe, and if Councilor McLaren could correct me if I'm wrong, what he really is trying to get to is that the strategic planning is really a council-led effort and that it be viewed as council setting the priorities and not staff, in, in essence. Is, is that correct? And if, and if Yes, that's exactly correct. The difference between council-led and staff-led in a governance exercise. Okay, I, I, I can agree with the prior, with the idea there. I just can't reconcile how this gets to that. And I think that, again, this just creates a whole bunch of confusion because essentially you have a facilitator who will facilitate but not actually do anything with the facilitation unless we're all there and won't develop priorities, can't summarize them, won't establish an approach or an agenda and won't roll up the session results. So I'm trying to figure out in my mind what we're paying the facilitator for if they can't facilitate. So I don't, I understand what your point is, and I, and I think the public would agree that, yes, the strategic planning should be a council-led priority. I just don't understand how that gets us to that. And in my mind, we might as well just not have a facilitator with this because we're paying somebody to essentially stand aside while we do everything. And the idea of the facilitator, in my mind, from previous experience, is somebody has to come in there neutral and take 13 distinct ideas and 13 distinct needs. And this is one of the benefits of being elected by district is, as Councillor Hill mentioned earlier, we should all have a pretty good grasp on what those issues are. But somebody, not any one of us, has to take all those ideas and come up with a plan forward. So I would offer to you that it is, it is council-led and I understand where you're trying to get. You really want to put that out there. I just don't know if this does it. So, May I answer that? Was that a question? Yeah, rhetorical, but I'll, ask, I'll also ask it to give him a chance to, to speak to okay. it. Councillor McLaren? Thank you. So you're right. The facilitator takes the ideas that we have, presents them to us, but we make the decisions, not her or him, whoever it might be. And that's the nuanced difference that we want to get here. So... If you feel that uh, what you described as a facilitator can be put in different words, I would be very happy to it. I quoted those words from the report as the ones that were objectionable. So when you look at that and you say, it looks like she's going to be developing the priorities. And then I ask you, should she? How can we make that better? 
I would be very happy to understand that. The design the session, again, that's sort of what we want to do because the design almost sets the, the results. If you design it a certain way, you'll get something else. What do we want out of it? That's part of what she can facilitate. She can help bring that out, but she shouldn't set it for okay. us. So I think that that's a, a response to the question. Next time, this is Councillor Hill. Does that help? So I've uh, participated in many strategic planning sessions over the course of my uh, working years as an educational manager uh, and on different boards. Uh, in almost every case, and certainly in every case where it was successful, we used an outside facilitator. Mm -hmm. uh, the outside facilitator is there to remove bias. They're not there to contribute bias. I, I don't. Uh, I don't see that. That uh, I think what that suggests is that somehow the uh, outside facilitator would be set up by staff. And I just. I, I just can't accept that that premise. I mean, I've spoke to a, a number of local management experts after uh, Councillor McLaren sent out his uh, explanation of the motions, and all of them indicated to me that. Uh, that uh, third party with no stake in the outcome is a very effective tool that ensures that every point of view is considered. Uh, this facilitator is not particularly expensive, not compared to some that I've seen in the past. And I think the results that uh, I have read, at least in, in terms of the strategic plan that came out of council from last year, are very valuable, obviously cost effective, and provided the uh, expertise that allowed uh, uh, the input from the public uh, from uh, maybe not as much from the public in that in the, in the same regard as we're going to do this year, but but certainly from uh, staff and from uh, from councillors. So uh, I, I I don't support that in in any in any fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Will you take the chair? Certainly, Your Worship, and you have the floor. Thank you. I feel very strongly about this this motion. Ms. Gibson is a very effective facilitator. Mm -hmm. She did an excellent job four years ago. If this passes, it will tie her hands and she will be nervous to do the facilitation that gets us to where we need to get. If I was coming in as a facilitator and I saw this, I would be like, I don't know what I can or cannot say or how I can or cannot facilitate this. this this is not going to augment. This is not going to improve. This is not going to lead to a better session. This is going to do exactly the opposite. I'm wondering if staff have any comment on this, on how uh, they would interpret this or, or their feelings on how this would affect the strategic planning process. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So it, um, it's usually a process when you you're trying to bring a group together and do brainstorming it is quite common to have an external facilitator to lead the process because you're going to have different opinions and and it's important to have somebody lead that process and have a proposed approach that the group will agree on as well as an agenda I'm not sure how technically a group can walk into a planning uh, uh, process without any kind of agenda and just try to decide that once they're there. I, I'm assuming that setting the agenda could take pretty much an entire session based on the conversations tonight. Um, I, with all due respect, uh, Mr. Mayor, I, I do have to make uh, a couple of comments. I think the underlining issue here seems to be a lack of trust in staff. That's what keeps coming up through these motions. Um, I would suggest that if that is the case, council has the ability to address issues with staff. There are definitely uh, processes in closed session where they can discuss performances of staff, uh, where they, they definitely can do that. The other thing is, if there is a lack of trust in staff, council does not have to approve every report or recommendation that does come from staff. Um, but I, I, do, I do have to say this because it, it's quite clear that there is a significant lack of trust in staff and, and uh, some thinking that staff will go in and try to change council priorities after the fact. So, so thank you for that. And I, I think that I will use my remaining time to emphasize that, that um, certainly I can speak for, uh, I believe, the vast majority of council, um, that we do have support 
uh, for staff, that we do trust the work that staff does, and that we do understand what our roles are. This session will be counsel and our facilitator. The facilitator is not there to inject ideas. It's not, her goal is not to try to steer counsel in a direction it doesn't want to go. For those of you that were there four years ago, you know that she is very skilled at trying to bring us together, and that's exactly what we need, especially after the last couple of hours of debate here tonight. So that is why I will strongly urge council to please vote against this particular motion. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and I return the chair. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Neal. Thank you. I don't say this every day, but I agree with Councillor Bohm's comments. Uh, the, I, I totally, and we all embrace the idea that we're the governance body, we're the policy-making body in the city. If at any time we feel that through some kind of interference or something that isn't happening, that's the time we need to stand up and make a, make a comment about it through the mayor, through council, uh, through the CAO's office, if, if need be. I'm not sure that I can't, I've, I've read this motion amendment eight times now, and I'm still confused by the wording of this. If someone, if some future council were to look at this or somebody else, I, I'm not sure that there'd be any clarity in what the process suggestion is there. But having said that, I just want to say it's the same facilitator we've had in the last two uh, sessions. And I remember her countless times pausing and to say, have, have we captured what what you mean here? Is this what your intent was? And so the suggestion, I mean, my recollection is she goes out of her way to make sure that she, in a neutral way, is capturing the intent of what, what is being said. And so uh, I agree, this is a really good facilitator if I was, and I've facilitated strategic planning things in the past, I don't know, this would not be very instructive, and I'm not sure that I would want to engage in the process with this, this kind of instruction. So I will not be able to vote for this, but please, if you feel that our governance function or our policy making function is being limited by staff at any time, that's when we need to speak up about it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I have been quite quiet because um, I'm really trying to understand it all too. I, I was not at the last uh, strategic plan and, um, and I, it's not as easy for me to communicate uh, as clearly as some of you guys, so uh, I will try to do that. But I, this, you know, um, I, I share how troubled, I, I feel very troubled with this, and um, and so I can only be pushed so far, I guess. But um, I just want to say in my time on council, um, I know why, you know, you bring a fresh, fresh face in and you, uh, you, you, he, the person will listen and learn and see. And, uh, you know, many, many people ask me how, you know, about, you know, that vibe in the city. And I, I, I just want to say that I, I, I think that there's a great trust. Um, this does not reflect, in my mind, my view, that is not a reflection of councils, uh, any kind of mistrust for, for staff. I just don't see it. And I'm, I think I'm pretty sharp with some things. So uh, I please, I hope that that does not uh, come in any way, shape or form. But, um, you know, so I, I've observed it. I can't, can't support this and I think that um, th th this is heading down the wrong road. Um, what I wanted to say was, it's coming to my mind, <laughs> is that 
I, I understood all the way through that the strategic plan that we've had from 15 to 18 was a complete success. <laughs> you know, so we're making an awful lot of changes or looking at the opportunity when we've actually really hit the ball out of the park. And we all know that the measures and all that, that we could have done better, okay? And I, we all see it. Absolutely, we could do better. And I know the particular areas we could do better. So, um, but that that's what we acknowledge. We're not perfect. So, well, I just don't see why we need radical change uh, on, on all these when we know we're doing really well. We, every one of us knows we can do better. So I'm sorry to keep going, but I just want to say that there's no way I could possibly support this. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, I wanted to speak against this amendment from my personal experience. Uh, during my grad school and after for about five years, so from the years of 2012 to 2017, I was contracted by a number of organizations, nonprofits locally, government agencies, and one of the political parties in the Ontario legislature to do strategic planning as their facilitator. And while I believe strongly that this is not the intent of the mover, uh, this amendment would completely paralyze any facilitator that is going to meaningfully engage with, with the issues. Of course, that does not mean that they should govern. Uh, I believe that the candidate before us to facilitate strategic planning, should we agree upon her, would agree with that sentiment entirely. And as Councillor Neal said, it's again incumbent upon us to, if we think those lines have been blurred, and they would be unintentional, I'm sure, given the professionalism of the facilitator on the docket. We are to speak up at that time. Uh, any good facilitator would welcome that feedback and would accommodate accordingly. So again, the intent of the mover is not, I believe, to um, muddy the waters, but it really would. The facilitator would be uh, with her hands tied behind her back. So please don't vote in favor of this amendment. Thank you. Next time I list is Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. My name's on this amendment. Um, I did, when the clerk asked me, I, I did nod because I actually, like Councillor Garrison of years past, I have a pro policy of seconding any, any amendment someone, or motion that someone brings to me to get it on the floor. But I never, I didn't like this when I first saw it. And I didn't think it actually accomplishes the intent in the first place. And I, I think it fails in its execution. Um, so I think I can, I think I can in, in one or two sentences actually explain what I think the mover is trying to accomplish is this and why this is not the way to do it. So in the, in the sheet that he uh, passed to me earlier today, there's some whereases and everyone knows you can't put whereases on amendments. But it said, I'll just read what I had. It, 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 with that fact, if you're ever trying to give the, the preamble to an amendment, like the whereas type formalized, you need to do it in your, in your speaking, which Councillor McLaren did. But basically, it says right in the report um, that the facilitator would assist in developing the priorities, work with the CAO and team to design and facilitate the planning session, establish and approach the agenda, and roll up session results. What, he, what really happened was in between the first day and the second day, there was a private session with the facilitator and the CAO and possibly probably some other senior staff where they tried to make sense of the, of the priorities that we had identified and tried to give it some practical reality and then came back to us for the second night for ratification and wordsmithing and so on. Now, if you object with that process, as Councilor McLaren clearly does, I don't think the, the uh, solution is to hobble or handcuff the facilitator with this kind of wording. The solution is to not have a facilitator at all. And to uh, Commissioner Hurdle's very, that actually, I, I felt a little hurt when I heard her say this, the fact of a lack of trust. I'd like to assure the commissioner that that's not true. Personally, I do not have a lack of trust for you. I'd like to just assure you that in open session. I trust you. Uh, that is not the issue to me, I don't think, with the majority of my colleagues. Uh, but you are correct that some of these uh, amendments, the way they're worded, seem to imply a lack of trust. What uh, 
what this amendment actually would do is, uh, yeah, further the divide amongst us here at council, further the divide between us and staff, and definitely drive a wedge between us and any potential facilitators. So um, that's that's just thinking it through. Uh, I think I think what the mover needs to do is decide whether or not he likes the idea of a facilitated strategic planning session. And if he has a better model for strategic planning, he needs to circulate it to us in advance. And I was hoping to do that at, at, at the committee of uh, the administrative policy. And I, I really think we've proven tonight with the two hour discussion we've had on this that that this is really not being, it's not very productive anymore. So anyway, I'm gonna vote against this amendment and I, I would recommend to the mover that we maybe move on to the next item after this. Thank you. Councilor Doherty. We had a lot of great opportunities tonight, particularly for the new councillors to hear some of the, uh, um, the experiences at the last strategic, strategic planning session. But I think it's really important that we work together to, uh, and that needs to come from a place of trust. Um, I am also voting against this motion, but I also want to speak to um, the negative sentiment that we heard today towards the trusting staff. And I think that's a real concern. Um, in the next four years, I think it's really important that we work together as a team. We don't have to agree. In fact, it's very good that we come from different perspectives. Um, but we, want, we do want to work together. We, and that includes bringing the community in. And I felt today's discussion was about giving the community more opportunities to be involved in the process, in the strategic planning process. But the discussions now have really I think stain tonight. And I think that's really disappointing. And um, I'm definitely not voting for this. Thanks. So anybody else who wishes to speak? Councilor McLaren, you have the floor. Thank you. Okay, so clearly I miss, uh, gave the wrong impressions. Really simply, um, the intent is to bring out of the shadows into the clear light what's happening between the meetings. If you look at the wording, choose if the facilitator will facilitate. I'm not objecting to that. So everybody who thought that I was suggesting that uh, the facilitator shouldn't facilitate, I am suggesting that they do. In fact, I'm also suggesting, if you look closely, that they set the process, that they develop the priorities, that they design the planning sessions, that they establish an approach and an agenda, and roll up the results with counsel, not without. That's the difference. It's not a hamstring or a paralyzation. She did a great job, I remember that. She did an awesome job, in fact. The parts that I object to is the parts that happened behind closed doors. That should be brought out into the light of day. That's what I'm asking for here. And if I can say it better, would it be helpful um, that, uh, that she just do things with us as opposed to um, outside of our committee? or our committee of the whole, if that's better, I would be happy to amend it that way. But to speak to some of the other misconceptions, uh, this isn't about a lack of trust, okay? It's about oversight, it's about governance. Governance means that we spot check, that we act as if we do not trust to keep them on their toes. If we actually do not trust, then we should be looking to fire some people. There's only one person we're supposed to fire. I'm not interested in firing anybody because we trust them. But it is part of our job as oversight to spot check, to act as if we do not trust. That um, failing to see that the act of spot checking is similar to an act of not trusting is it, they're similar, of course, but the action that goes behind it is oversight, which is our job. Anyway, that's enough. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote on the motion to amend. Please vote. That loses by a vote of one to 12. 
Council McLaren, you have 18 seconds left on the clock, but I'm going to appeal to you. Okay, really quick amendment. To move, to move on. Okay, you've had, last You've amendment. had the floor now for well over an hour and a half, but you have the right, you have 18 seconds left. Okay, last amendment. Uh, the one that's uh, labeled number 12, please. This one reads that the consultant's proposal speaks to ensure, um, okay, that the consultant's uh, proposal speaks to ensuring that the, the key current city initiatives are woven into the document. And as a point of strategic planning, it strikes me that the place for current reports or current projects is in the budget, but not in strategic planning. So the purpose of this last uh, one is to ask that we talk about what's new or what's changed as opposed to what is continuing because what's continuing is properly in the budget where strategic planning is about a new future state which we uh, won't achieve unless we actually change direction and that's what we should be highlighting and expanding on. So um, hopefully it'll come up in a second but I'll read it. Uh, that the following that clause be added, that only new and or changed initiatives discussed and approved in the three-day strategic planning session be included in the final document. Excuse me, Councillor McLaren, could you clarify who your seconder is? Councillor Osanek. Councillor Osanek, are you seconding that motion? Can we just get it up on the screen, please? Okay, uh, Councilor McLaren, is there anything else you wish to say to this motion? Based on your appeal, I'll defer now, and uh, if uh, people have objections, I'll deal with them at the end. Councilor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I support this amendment in our strategic plan. Definitely, like in the preamble at the beginning, anything can be said. But um, in this strategic plan, invest in infrastructure, one of the um, headlines is roadways and sidewalks, and it refers to our four-year infrastructure plan, which we will always have. We had it eight years ago, we had it four years ago, we have it today, we're definitely gonna have it tomorrow. So when we go into these strategic planning sessions at the end of March, they are very fast. Those three nights whip by. I don't think we should be rehashing some of the things that are just a given that we have to do as a corporation. Everyone knows we have to do it, or even the third crossing, are we going to have that as one of our post-it notes? It's already been decided. So um, that's what this is getting at. It's just the new and the changed things that we should be focused on because we're not going to have a lot of time in those sessions. They do go by very quickly. Thank you. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? You have the chair, Your Worship. Thank you. So, there is a difference between the annual report and the strategic planning session. The annual report is a comment on everything that we do as a city. And I think it's also important to understand that we are building on the work of previous councils. So, we probably will want to look to ways that we can link this strategic plan to the last one. I think the last thing that we want is a completely disjointed veer off in direction. That's certainly not the, the sense that I get from this council. And I really don't think that that is what is going to happen. We're gonna build this up from scratch and absolutely we can tie it in to say this is how it connects to what we've done, but now these are our priorities and this is where we're going. I, I just, I'm trying to choose my words carefully, but this almost borders on paranoia, in, in my view. Uh, we are honestly, we are just building on the work that we've done. And again, I think that if we trust ourselves, we trust the facilitator and we trust our staff, and the fact that all wording is gonna come back to us anyways for approval, that at that point, we can say if there's something that we don't like, then sure, we can take it out. But I would just encourage council, uh, you know, 
rather than having a full debate on this, again, I, I just can't support this, uh, but I do believe that we can have a great strategic planning session where we can put together great priorities. It's going to link to the past. It's going to point to the future. Uh, that's really what I'm looking forward to. Thank you. And I return the chair. Okay, next on my list, Councilor Bohm and then Deputy Mayor Straub. Councilor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I also have uh, many concerns with this, and uh, some of those are sometimes to know where you're going, you have to know where you've been. So if we want a strategic plan, which we do, and we're building on it, and we've had some successes, then we do need to link those successes. And uh, some of those successes are going to carry over, and some of them are going to be new ones. Another thing to point out here is we have four new faces around these, around these chambers. So it's important that for them to get into this and really understand how we got here, they need to know where we came from. So part of these things are, these are overlapping priorities. It's, I mean, we can't just pull the foundation out of the house and expect the rest of it to stand. Um, there's also a new residents could move in and, and just read this strategic plan. So, so when we say that, well, we don't really need that because we already know it was there. Well, that's true for some of us, but not all of us. So we really do kind of need to have a wholesome, holistic document that shows where we came from, what's our plan, and where we're going. And that kind of, again, does sort of what the previous motion does, where it sort of ties our hands as to how we're actually going to get there. So I think I said it earlier, but I think... Just let's move forward. We can do the strategic planning. We're going to approve the final document. We're going to see draft forms. We're going to get there, but let's stop trying to do it ahead of time. Let's actually go and do it, and then we can deal with these issues if and when they come up in the future. So I will not be supporting this one either. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thanks. I'm going to stand up. I'm getting cramped. Uh, I am going to support this one because I think, it, well, it's self-evident why, why it makes sense. Less is more. Uh, putting putting things that they're already doing that we didn't talk about in strategic planning into the strategic plan is nonsensical, okay? That the, the example that Councillor Osanic gave about following the four-year infrastructure plan for roads and sidewalks, which is a given, and which had nothing to do with strategic planning because we didn't talk about it in strategic planning. We did say invest in infrastructure, but we talked about specific projects. And those also made it in here. And I would say that if you've got an ongoing priority that isn't new, so, so there's a problem a little bit with the wording here, because an ongoing priority can be discussed at strategic planning and can make it into the priority list, even if it's already existent. For example, protect heritage, for example, just as use an example. Say we want to continue to protect heritage. I mean, it's been around 200 years, why would we all suddenly stop? Uh, we, would, we do need to say it as strategic planning, if we're serious. If we want to protect heritage, we have to put it in, in this strategic plan. And actually, that's one of the ones where I question whether we did actually follow the strategic plan from last time, because of all the problems with the Heritage Committee and how we went backwards instead of forwards on protecting heritage. So, uh, you know, that's implementation. That's, that's the theme I want you to remember from my comments tonight, is the problem isn't with the plan, the problem is with the implementation. And we're never sure uh, that we're getting what we said, what we were told we were going to get in the document. This will pare down the document to just what we talked about in the session. And if you want something to continue, bring it up on the session. Write it on your little card and bring it up at the session. Then it becomes, it, it's back in the plan. But to have staff insert things about roads and sidewalks that we didn't talk about into the document because it looks nice, because it fills up one of the columns, that's not a lack of trust when I'm calling them on that. That's just me saying that is diluting the document with things that don't need to be there. So for that reason, I strongly support this amendment. Thank you. Um, Councillor Neal. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm not sure that this has a whole lot of value added uh, in the end. We come up with six or seven priorities. That doesn't mean that everything that was a previous priority in another year is going to get swept away and forgotten. Uh, so um, if perchance transparency and open government isn't one of the top six or seven for this strategic plan, for reasons of context and continuity, 
I would hope that the next strategic plan at least acknowledges those aspects on an ongoing basis. That so, so we don't, we purposely come up with six or seven of our top priorities, but that doesn't mean that our previous priorities get forgotten. It doesn't mean that the ongoing business of a good, uh, a good organize, municipal organization like filling potholes and doing uh, those kinds of things don't get acknowledged as a commitment to the community. So I, uh, I can't see how this adds any value to the process. And in fact, I think it would diminish the final project product. So I won't be able to support it. Thank you. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Very quickly, I think um, uh, just I'm also not in favor of this amendment, mainly because um, it's difficult to say what the final document should be looking like, um, and we will have the opportunity to review the final document and make changes uh, at that time. So for that reason, I will not be supporting. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. <clears throat> Well, this is one way of doing strategic planning, is what appears to be proposed here. But it's not the only one. And in our situation, it's probably not the best one because people forget what we're doing. OK, that's the first reason. And we're always trying to remind them that we are doing things. And you know, within the relative to the resources we have or they're willing to give us, <clears throat> the other thing is that councils can back away from priorities. And uh, I can remember a, a just recent famous case where we said, and I believe all council believe, believe this, is that if we didn't get $60 million from the Freds and the province, we weren't doing the bridge. And it was very clearly written, okay? I'm not saying everybody read it. I'm not saying everybody believed it. There's people that were dead set against it regardless, obviously, and those who were for it regardless, but they weren't taking the budget into account. Right, so there we would have backed away. We would have said not now probably, right? So that's just a, a provocative example, right? A clear example. But sometimes you realize this doesn't really work in any organization. Let's do it differently, or maybe we should reassess what we're doing. So I think this is probably fine in an organization where you're absolutely sure what you're doing and you're repeating it elsewhere and all that. I think staff puts these things in to remind people that you are doing certain things and they are important and we haven't forgotten them. <laughs> And um, I think the last thing I want to say is that um, we can, we should, um, I don't know, just forget it. Just, uh, let's just, I'm not going to vote for this because it's not, I don't think it, as Councillor Neal says, it doesn't add enough. And we go, oh, I know what the point was. The point was, if we want to stress what the new things are, write the document accordingly. So when is strategic planning, to say, here they are. Now, we, we do general themes. That's fine. That's good. And we include under them the different things plus things we're already doing, which is a good process because with some of it might be self-contradictory or contrary, right? So, and then you can weed all that out. But I think for that reason, I can't vote for this particular part because... Uh, Although it might be good for one organization, I don't think it's so good for this one. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we go any further, it is uh, 1049. We need a motion to extend the meeting. Councillor Neal, a motion to a motion to complete the to complete the agenda. Is there a seconder? Moved by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 12 to, to 1. 
Good try, Councillor Chappelle. We are, we are here to the bitter end tonight. <laughs> Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the uh, motion to amend? I see none. Councillor McLaren, you have the floor. I think that'll be enough. Thanks. Thank you. So we will call the vote on the motion to amend. Please vote. And that loses by a vote of 3 to 10. Okay, so now we are back to the uh, clause as amended. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to it? I think we've all spoken lots. This is back to the original, original staff recommendation. Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. I do have just one <laughs> amendment to make. One amendment. And so this is just about going into the priority setting session. So we know now that we're going to have an online survey and get written comments. And I would like to, for us as council, to see that prior to the strategic session. Also, um, I would like possibly for us to submit whatever priorities we have prior to the session too. And then for that to be compiled just so we can see what all of us are thinking going into it. And because with the three nights, like the ones of us that have been through it in 2014 and 2010, um, we first break off into little groups, and then that's when we're given our post-it notes to write out our priorities. And then it's all put up on a board. So I'm not saying that we couldn't still add some priorities that very first night if we, you know, thought of some new ones, but if we could get whichever ones we do have submitted ahead of time and start sharing it, it would be a lot easier. Some of us were smart enough that night that we put up all the post-it notes to take a picture on our cell phone. I didn't think of that idea, right? And so I found it really hard to try to like look at all these post-it notes and then we get little stickers and according to the number of dots on the post-it note, that's what priority one, priority two is. And I just found that really rushed and I would have preferred to have like more time to reflect and think about it. So that's why I was thinking if we could send our priorities ahead of time and like I said, Said that first night we could still add some more if we think of some more, but that would give us longer to be prepared for those sessions because they are three nights in a row. Uh, is that motion to amend? Can we just see that up on the screen, please? Okay, so it's moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor Stroud, that Council be asked to submit their priorities in advance of the strategic sessions at the end of March by due date determined by the City Clerk's Office having received the public feedback first, and the Council receive a copy of their compilation in advance of, of the sessions. Um, the, the last part of that is, is technically moot given that we've already passed an amendment asking specifically that we would receive a written compilation of all of the comments. Yeah, so that was in the, in, oh, you mean of, of, of councils, oh, I see, I, I understand, I understand. Okay, uh, so the motion is on the floor. Councillor Sanic, is there anything else you wish to say to it? Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Holland? Thank you, Your Worship. Um, well, I agree that this is this is a useful proposal in some respects. Um, the I'm I will we'll wait for further discussion before I decide how I am voting. I think my main concern with this is that we've talked a lot tonight about um, a lack of transparency in the process, and I have some reservations about the potential for members of council to essentially trade votes on particular priorities, and I really liked the way the format of the session was the last time, and that all of that work and discussion had to take place in a group format. Um, the, there would be, if this passes, there would be nothing to prevent members of council for, from doing such a thing, uh, and I don't mean to sort of put any motives on anyone, but it, it certainly is something that happens, that that councillors have discussions behind the scenes and ask for support and lobby for support. Um, and that's not something I'm interested in engaging in. I, I really think the public information is going to be the most valid going into this session and having that written report on the public information uh, is most important. Um, the 
and so I guess I'm, at this point I'm leaning in, in, in the direction of not supporting this because I want to have all discussions related to priorities um, take place publicly. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I, I completely agree with what uh, Councillor Holland said. There is uh, essentially, if we want to have the most open and transparent process, I think it should be uh, to receive the feedback from the public in an open forum, and obviously anybody can attend. And also, in the grand scheme of things, once they do the survey, there's nothing stopping any councillor from going out to their constituency and saying, send you all the feedback or directing the constituency to actually go and fill this out, which I think we should all do. We should all encourage people to go and fill that out. And then we can carry those things in with us. And on top of that, I mean, sure, if you want, fill out the survey yourself, but you're, you're going to be in the room. So, I mean, again, this is another motion that... I, I just I find it kind of redundant in, in the grand scheme of things because we're going to be right there. We're going to be doing it. We have that knowledge. Uh, Councillor Holland raises a good point of you know kind of things starting to sort of be discussed outside. And if it's between three or four councillors, it's not really fair to the rest of council to have that conversation because then we're not part of that conversation. And you start to have many priority setting happening. And and I don't think that's really in in the whole scheme of things, an ideal way to approach this if we want to have the most open and transparent way. And those conversations may be beneficial to councillors, and if you're not privy to them, you don't really get all that content. So, I, again, I'm not going to, so I seem to be very negative tonight, I apologize, but I'm not going to support this either. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thank you. Um, well, this one I seconded, but I am not going to oppose, or in other words, I am going to support. And I'm going to try to, um, I'm going to try to explain it in a different way than, because, and I'm also going to address comments for the two previous members. So, okay, agreed, uh, trading votes between councillors to get their own, you know, personal high ranking priorities in and that kind of thing does happen, can happen. And I, and my question is, whether this passes or not, how does it become more or less likely? Because any of us can share our priorities with each other at any time. So th this isn't about, this, it's not like without this, everybody's priorities are secret. It's without this, nobody has, a, and we don't all have access to all before we go in and get our, our heads around the priorities so that we can start thinking about what we're going to support. I'm telling you, having gone through it the first time, I was a little shocked, pleased and shocked, how well it went, considering how new a lot of the information was. And so in some ways, that can be good. And I actually am really comfortable with instinctively reacting to new information. You know, having learned seven languages and, and more than one career, I'm, I'm used to being, to learning quickly and on the spot and, and, and thinking instinctively. Also in music, you often, when you're playing a solo, um, you know, on an instrument, you're doing that instinctively as well. I'm comfortable with it. However, it's not necessarily for everyone. Some people need the information in advance if they want to make a meaningful decision. So let's not misconstrue that for this for what it is. This is simply sharing information that's important, that mostly information from our constituents, I'm going to, I'm going to hope. You're, 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 when you sit down to write your priorities that you're bringing forward, you're going to be thinking, what did the, the constituents tell me at the door? Uh, what's important to them? Uh, I know these are the priorities that they have. Have I left anything out? Once you do that, if you just show up at the door and have to react to everybody else's, obviously there's going to be a lot of overlap anyways. But what about the ones that, you know, from, say, Councillor Osterhoff up in Countryside, uh, if I don't know in advance what his constituents have told him, I, can, I, I'm, I, I may not consider it on my list of priorities, but if I have time to look at it in advance, I can see how it matches up with some of mine being from two different parts of the city, one from the country and one from right downtown, right? So I don't see how this does anything but add value. Uh, it is sharing information. Now, as far as, it, it was a valid point that Councillor Holland said about it should be transparent, it should be in public, it should be done publicly. So then the question should be maybe should, when the public feedback is compiled, 
we've never talked about this, we're going to get a copy of that. Is the public also going to get a copy of that? Hopefully, yes. Then I would suggest we do that as well with the advanced uh, priorities that each councillor has brought forward. That is more transparent because your constituents are going to be looking to say, well, is he going to do what he said he was going to do when he, when he talked to me at the do door? Is he going to do what he put in his literature? You know, that they get to see it if we publish publicly. So I think that's the way that you, you get to that piece. The transparency piece is actually you share it with the whole city. Uh, so I really encourage you to, to consider supporting this because it will make what was already a, a good session even better. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the chair and I recognize you. So I've listened to the discussion as it's gone on, um, but now what I seem to be hearing is that we're all going to choose our priorities and we're going to tell people about the priorities before we've even done the strategic planning session, which I think is deeply, deeply problematic, and I'm not, I, I, while I understand the intent of this, I think it has unintended consequences. So that's my biggest concern on this. There is something about, having done this twice, there is something about going into this, having in your mind what you would like to see, but also walking in with an open mind and being willing to change your mind at the last minute. You don't know <laughs> We don't immediately just walk in and start writing down our priorities. We have an initial discussion. The facilitator is going to walk us through. We have had two months of education around this. It's really important that we set a very just fair and transparent view on this, that we're going to go in, and we're not just going to talk, we're going to listen. And the problem is if we do too much of this work beforehand, what's going to happen is there's going to be a bunch of stuff on the board, and then suddenly we're going to be wrestling with what we've already talked about instead of walking in on that initial discussion. So again, I understand the intent. I appreciate it. My concern is the unintended consequences are actually far outweigh the benefits of it. And so that's why, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to support this. Thank you. And I return the chair. Thank you very much. Councillor Hill. Um, sorry, Councillor Hill and then Councillor Chappelle. Oh, you're okay. You've waited. Okay, Councillor Chappelle. Just with regards to the process for the strategic planning, are we deadlocked on three nights? Like, is, do we reserve the privilege to extend it if we feel we don't have enough time or there's some really good discussion and debates going on, we can work through it? Just like tonight, you know, we've extended it. Can we not do that for strategic planning if we had to? So, um, would staff like to answer that? Commissioner Hurdle? Through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, it can uh, it can be extended. That's not an issue. It it all depends on the willingness of council members to want to make the time to uh, to extend uh, the process. Okay. So anybody else who wishes to speak, Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, to build on a point from Councillor Stroud, I also absolutely believe that any public feedback that we receive through um, the amended motion must be made public to do otherwise would just to increase the opaqueness of the process so when we get that information it should be made public however i don't read that in this amendment so i won't be supporting it thank you councilor mclaren thank you can we just amend and add the word public after uh receive a public copy of their compilation in the advance of the session okay so we have a motion to uh, amend the amendment. Moved by Councilor McLaren, seconded by Councilor Stroud. A discussion on the motion to amend. Councilor Holland. Okay, so are we now saying then that the, pub the public information that is compiled is now a part of this motion? So or the release of that information. So, <laughs> I'm going to ask a question of staff. Going back to the previous amendment that we passed three hours ago, when we were talking about the initial public consultation and that we, we would receive a summary and compilation of all of those comments, would it be staff's intention to also make that public? 
I'm just wondering if I could get an answer on that. Anybody? To you, Mr. Mayor, I'll answer that question. Okay, thank you. So the, the initial compilation of the written information is based on that special meeting that we're having in the open session. I'm sorry, in the, um, uh, in the session that we're having in Memorial Hall, um, in the open house session. This other information that my understanding is based on the motion that's on the screen, and I apologize, I just walked in, is dealing with a compilation on the comments from council with that's respect to their Sorry. priorities. Sorry. So they're two separate items. Right. Council Holland. Really sorry, but I'm completely confused. So the addition of the word public to amend this, however it was to be amended, where would that word go? I, I don't understand either. Council McLaren, can you clarify? That council be asked to submit their priorities in advance of the strategic planning session at the end of March by a due date determined by the city clerk's office, having received the public feedback first, and the council receive a public copy of their compliment, complimentation, complimentation in, in advance of the sessions. Thank you. So to be clear, the word there is, in, is referring to council. Okay. So basically, the motion to amend this amendment is basically saying that everything that council Council's priorities would be made public in advance of the strategic planning session. So, first of all, on the motion to amend, so moved by Council McLaren, is there a seconder for this? Seconded by Deputy Mayor Stroud. Is there any discussion? Councillor Kiley? <laughs> There's no such thing as a point of clarification, that there's a point of order. Point of order? Yeah. Around the intent of adding public and your clarification, Mr. Mayor, of there, is the information that would be made public the compilation of the council's priorities before the yes. meeting and not necessarily the information that was collected both online and in the session That's right. to be held on February 19th? That's right. So this, this motion oh, is solely dealing with what would be the thoughts or input from each of us and that we would all receive it and that the public would all see it in advance of the strategic planning sessions. So just so everyone's clear on the intent. Is there any discussion on the, mo the amendment to the amendment? Councillor Bohm? Thank you, Your Worship. And I, I believe I understand the amendment to the amendment. My, my concern with the amendment, and it almost carries over the entire thing, is that we're releasing... We're trying to be more transparent, but we're essentially releasing priorities in advance of doing strategic planning, which in my mind is just gonna lead to more confusion amongst the public, and we're not gonna be able to control that message. And then all of a sudden, everybody's gonna see, well, let's assume there's 13 of us, and we all come up with, I don't know, 10 or five or whatever number. And all of a sudden, you've got 100 plus priorities out there before you've actually held strategic planning. So again, I can't support the amendment and I, just okay. because it's going to cause that additional confusion amongst the public, which we're okay. trying to get focused in to do the actual consultation on the strategic planning so we can have good information going into that. So to be clear, and thank you for that, to be clear, we are talking about the addition of the word public in this particular motion. Once we've done that, then we will talk about the motion to amend, either as amended or not amended. Uh, Councilor Doherty. I was just trying to imagine if when we have our um, priorities it, for our districts that um, exactly what Councillor Boehm was just saying, um, that our districts will think that these are the priorities and we set expectations and uh, only to end up in our strategic planning session for those to be, some of them to end up off the table. And then people will be very upset and there will be real conf confusion. I understand what you're trying to do, um, but I think there will be major consequences. Councillor Hill. An important part of strategic planning is a brainstorming element to it. So uh, what we're doing is in effect, putting out our brainstorming before we ever walk into the room to uh, begin the strategic planning session. And what that will do is, I think, really temper uh, and, and reduce our sort of willingness to kind of be free in our thoughts and our thinking 
Uh, and uh, because we don't frankly want to look stupid in terms of what we put out there in the public before the strategic planning session even begins. So I can't support this motion. I just don't think it's going to get us to the right spot. Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? Take the chair and I recognize you. Everybody keeps smiling. We're, we're going to get, we're going to get there. Um, so here's, here's, the, here's the box that we now find ourselves in. Because if we're going to suddenly share input, oh, but did I give the chair away? I did. Yes. Take the so, chair away. Sorry, it's after eleven o'clock. On the so amendment I'm... to <laughs> yes, add the thank word. You. So public. I am going to speak to the republic. But here's the box that we have now put ourselves in, because now we're saying that we're going to to think up some priorities ahead of time. But of course, we want to be open and transparent. So that means we have to make it public. But now that we make it public, we're going to have one set of priorities that's going to go out ahead of time, and then, uh oh it's going to not be the same as the one that's going to come after, and that's just going to create mass confusion. People are going to be angry. They're going to be like, why well, was it on the initial list, but it's not on the list after the strategic planning session? This is like a giant bomb that would, that would go off. So my feeling is that you probably do have to vote in favor of this amendment to put the word public, because we want to be open and transparent. So I'm actually going to vote in favor of that, but that just shows just how deadly this, uh, this amendment has become. So I'm definitely going to vote against the motion to amend when we finally get to that. Thank you. Thank you. And I return the chair. Thank you. Anybody else that wishes to speak to the amendment by adding the word public into this motion to amend? Uh, yes. Uh, Deputy Mayor Strupp. Just to say that what you just ended with is very important. So, uh, so what are we actually doing? We're adding a word which will make it public and transparent, which is consistent with our uh, transparency objective, and Councillor Kaidi mentioned this as well. That's all we're talking about right now, though. That's all we're talking about on this vote is adding the word public. And I'm going to say yes. Okay, so we will call the vote on the amendment to the amendment, which would be to add the word public in the last line. And that carries by a vote of 12 to 1. So now we are back to the motion to amend with the word public. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak to the motion to amend? Uh, hold on. Uh, you, um, yes, Councilor McLaren. Thank you. So um, talking about some of the things that have been brought up, um, part of the benefits or the virtues of this is that there are no surprises. And... Um, when we don't have surprises, that means that we can actually reflect on what people have suggested. That reflection is not a bad thing. It actually furthers thought, constructive thought. The, the fear that was expressed that people would not, would think that we've set priorities before the council, se the uh, priority session, doesn't strike me as ra resoundingly yes. I mean, everybody understands that we come to council to make decisions and that the agendas are ahead of us uh, before we get there. The information, the reports are there. Nobody assumes that uh, it's going to be the way it is. That's why these are maybe better described as proposed priorities that we're coming to uh, speak on, to think about, to reflect on. So there's no surprises. One of the things that um, uh, I found uh, knowing about the last one was that uh, we weren't given enough time to actually think through everybody else's proposals. The very thought that um, we have to have an open mind doesn't preclude really thinking about it. If it comes and hits you with a new, if you come and get hit by a new idea, um, you're often, you often re have a visceral or a very affirmative re response to it. But with hindsight, with, re with real foresight, with foresight, or not foresight, sorry, with hindsight and with uh, reflection, you can see the benefits of that. That's the point of doing this ahead of time. We inform each other of what our priorities are. We inform the public so that they can be discussed having had reflection, not, having, not uh, at the spur of a moment without reflection. So I feel that to say that uh, this is going to lead people astray, I don't think so. Uh, I think people are smart enough to understand that what happens before the council meeting is not what necessarily happens after the council meeting. And just because we make a declaration that these are my personal priorities, uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to accept them. And I think everybody should understand that. Um, so no surprises, it's not redundant, it's actually better for good governance in the sense of 
thinking things through and having time to do that. Uh, so having an open mind doesn't preclude this. In fact, having an open mind enhances this. So please support it. Thank you. Uh, apologies, it's getting late. Councillor Hill, you are on my speaking list. Have you spoken? You have spoken, thank you. Just checking. Councillor Neal. Just very quickly, um, I very seldom vote against Councillor Osanek's motions, but here's my reluctance, and it's the same reluctance I had with the uh, upcoming motion. I think if you're asking for public consultation and you're asking and you're making a commitment to a brainstorming uh, strategic planning session, you shouldn't be laying all your cards out on the table and saying, here are my four or five priorities in advance of that. It's a process. And what I remember from both of the previous strategic planning was, yes, I went in with some priorities and some bias uh, and some plans, but it, it really was a kind of development of collegiality and listening to other people's priorities. I was, I was quite willing to use the dotocracy, I think it's called, uh, and support other people's plans, which I hadn't been committed to when I first went in. So I think, I think it behooves us to not go in with a set of these are the eight things that I really, really want. I mean, they're still in our mind. We're still committed to them, but we need to go in with a willingness to listen to everybody, to build a little bit of collegiality within the group, and to vote accordingly. So uh, the same reason I won't be supporting the idea of a list of priorities suggested in a motion prior to the strategic planning, I won't be supporting this. Okay, thank you. So Sorry, anybody else Lisa. who wishes to speak? Uh, yes, Councillors, um, you, Councillor Bum, I think you've already spoken to this. So, Councillor Osanek, you have the last word. Thank you. Um, I never meant for this to be a secret document. It would be part of the agenda, and just like the agenda public, those documents I was asking for, that was always my intent. Also, I'm glad that some people had a good experience listening to like lots of the post-it notes and everything. My experience was that there was three of us in a room for half an hour, and we had to, I had to listen to the one priority for the first 20 minutes that one other counselor really wanted, and so I didn't have the same utopia experience, unfortunately. And I was just trying to give more time so that I could process all the post-it notes before the limited number of dots that we get, six or nine, whatever it was, I could put, a, put around. I didn't know if I had enough to support the third crossing as well as the airport expansion in Brownfields. Which ones am I going to pick? Because I already put the other six on other things. So that's all my intention was. But because of this, and I know the way it's going to go, I withdraw my motion. Thank you, for Your Worship. OK. OK, thank you. Um, we are back to the. Clause as amended. Um, is there anybody else who wishes to speak to it? Okay. Okay. Let's let's just put it up just so we can see exactly what it is that we're voting on because we have discussed and, and amended it to some degree. Okay, so that is now a look at Clause 4 as amended. So the first, the first three clauses were in the original recommendation. Then there were the added three on the public consultation. 
and then we added um, the, the, the second last clause was also in the original recommendation, and then we added the last clause as well. You want me to read out the whole thing? Okay, so just so everyone's clear, the council directs staff to hold the 2019 strategic planning priorities, setting sessions in committee of the whole format, culminating the committee of the whole reporting back to council at the conclusion of the work, and the council endorsed the proposal submitted by Suzanne Gibson to form the basis for the facilitation and documentation work in support of the strategic planning priority setting sessions. And the council direct the CAO to issue the necessary purchase order to engage the services of Suzanne Gibson. And the council invite public input into the strategic planning process through written submissions from community stakeholder groups and an online survey. And that a special meeting of council in a modified open house format be held on Tuesday, February 19th, 2019 in Memorial Hall at 6 p.m. prior to the strategic planning sessions where members of the public can share ideas and input with members of council. And that council receive a compilation from the above noted public consultation in advance of the strategic planning sessions. And that council's committee of the whole provide direction to staff during the sessions on the level of public engagement to be undertaken on the draft priorities once developed in accordance with the city's public engagement strategy and that the 2019 strategic planning session also included a set of discuss, also discuss a set of measurables that can be used to determine the status of each strategic priority. Anybody else wishes to speak? Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you, and I'm sorry if this has been answered, but I'm slightly fuzzy. The question that I asked on a point of order around whether or not the public consultation that was conducted online and in the session on February 19th would be made public beforehand uh, I need to know if that is the case, yes or no. Through Commissioner Hurdle? Worship, that is correct. Okay. Okay. Thank so you, the answer Mr. Clark, yes. for your clarification. The answer yeah, is for yes. For your clarification. Because I think that's very important in all of this discussion. We've talked about transparency and accountability. The public wants to see what they've said and then what we decide, and that's the way that we can be held accountable to what we come up with at strategic planning. Okay. We will call the vote on Clause 4, as amended. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, so moving on. Find where we left off. So we will now move to report number eight from the CAO. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Neal. Pardon me, I'll start again. Moved by Councillor Hutchison, seconded by Councillor Neal, that report number eight from the Chief Administrative Officer recommend be received and adopted. Okay, so there is just the one clause. Cannabis retail stores in Kingston. Councillor Kiley. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And through you, uh, a question to staff on paragraph four pertaining to, and I'll quote, the allocation of approximately 300,000 from the Ontario Cannabis Legalization Implementation Fund as follows. Um, I'm wondering first, what was the process by which the allocation of these funds, uh, 77,000 to public health and 207,000 to police services, how did we get to that allocation? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you and uh, through you Mr. Mayor. So <clears throat> a couple of things, one is we looked at uh, the eligible expenses that uh, the province has set out for this particular fund, and that's under uh, provincial leg legislation. So they include things like police services, public health, by law enforcement, uh, fire services, et cetera. So they already have a list of the type of expenses that can be considered for these funds. The second part to, uh, to the answer is that um, we started to work with uh, public health and police services a while ago back in 2018 when we were expecting obviously this legislation in terms of cannabis legalization to come through and we worked with them to identify what they were expecting as far as implementation cost. So, Councillors that were on the previous council probably recall that back in July of uh, 2018, city staff brought a report to council to consider an allocation at that time, which was based on a previous provincial program. Those costs for police services were primarily around police officer training, as well as equipment um, that they used for uh, drug um, uh, testing and 
detection. The cost for public health is related to public education campaign, which public health started in 2018, and some of you might have seen some of the uh, campaigns such as Ash Out the, the Facts. So what we've asked this time around, because we are dealing now with a different provincial program, different uh, rules around the funding, and also a different amount of money that will be coming through at this point as initial, initial grant, is to, uh, for police services and public health to revise their numbers, considering that the implementation really started in 2018 with the legalization in October. So the numbers that are in front of you are based on revisions that have been made and uh, submitted by both police services and public health as far as what they felt was necessary to be able to accomplish uh, the things that I just described. And the remaining funds we would um, most likely look at redirecting at this point to, to bylaw services, but again, it is still difficult to know what um, what the implications will be with uh, retail stores in the city. Okay, thank you, Commissioner and Mr. Mayor, through you again. Uh, first, forgive me if some of the questions I ask have been dealt with in a previous council, but I would like to hear them in this council. Could you please expand on uh, the equipment costs and the officer's training? I know you mentioned briefly um, some of what that might be, but could you play that out for us a bit more, please? So thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the uh, most of the cost for police officer training is related to the uh, two programs, drug recognition expert and standardized field so sobriety, and I apologize for my pronunciation, testing. Um, and the majority of the funds that are identified of the $207,000 are for training. There's about 34,000 of that amount that is for the equipment cost, so the remainder is for that type of training. And there are a number of police officers that would be going through the training. I do have a breakdown of the number of officers that are uh, proposed on a yearly basis. So in 2019, there would be uh, 30 officers train um, in uh, one of the programs uh, and um, same thing for 2020 we're looking at another 30 officers as well thank you and a further question on the training costs and I recognize that uh, municipalities across Canada are implementing this for the first time so perhaps the answer will be difficult to come by but is there any data to show the efficacy of the training that will be undertaken, particularly pertaining to um, the drug recognition services that you've referenced? Commissioner Hurdle. So thank you, and, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So the training that's being proposed locally is, is similar to what's being applied or looked at for other police uh, services across the province, um, and to make sure that across the province, the, there is some consistency. Um, in terms of, of data, we, we don't yet have that because we are still in the initial stages. I think once we've gone through a full year of legalization and, and um, potentially retail stores, we'll have a better sense as well of, uh, of the implications. Thank you. Quickly to comment on the rationale behind my question. Um, I was initially concerned looking at these numbers that we were tipping the money that we have available to us from the province to deal with the legalization of cannabis towards police services. Not because the police are going to do a poor job, not because the work they do is not important. In fact, on the contrary, it is both important and they will do a good job. However, I think it does send a message that we look at the consumption of cannabis in a criminal mindset, which is what this legislation federally was intending to reverse, that cannabis is now decriminalized, it's in fact legal, and that it is a public health issue. So a quick glance at these numbers is startling uh, for someone like myself who believes that we should look towards our public health providers to help regulate, to help educate, and to help encourage uh, a very healthy way to consume this product. So uh, I believe the responses the commissioner has said given uh, is understandable, so I won't pursue that line of thought further, but that's why I ask such questions, because for the first time that we choose to spend money on 
legal cannabis to prioritize police servicing to such a disproportionate degree could give the long, wrong impression, but again, the answers are um, more than adequate. Thank you. Thank you. Next on my list is Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, <clears throat> I, this whole, it's the first time I've ever spoken publicly about cannabis, so I don't really know what to say. <laughs> Um, besides, I, you know, um, the time has come <laughs> for us to speak. So um, it is a really, really important time for us. And um, I, 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 I'm, I'm nervous about it. I'm nervous for our city, <laughs> you know, that we would uh, uh, embrace it or, uh, you know, to choose to, to um, uh, go this way. I, I, cause it, because of the unknown, I guess, I, I worry for it. And um, uh, a couple of questions, I guess. I, I'm, I am surprised that I have not heard a lot from constituents on this. It's, it's been quite quiet, even on the, on the trail campaign. Uh, not many, so that's interesting to me. Uh, and a, you know, a couple of calls of my advisors out there, and I appreciate them people too. Um, the, the 150 meters from schools really bothers me, and uh, I can't believe that I figured they read the one and the seven wrong. It's got to be 750 meters, but I guess it's not. Is that something we can manipulate um, at all? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So the 150 meter from schools is actually uh, implemented by the province, and that's part of the provincial legislation. Uh, cities, municipalities do not have the ability to change that. And not through planning or encouragement or whatever. So, okay. Th through Mr. Mayor, just to maybe add to that, the cities do not, municipalities have any um, roles in terms or authority as far as planning is concerned as it relates to uh, to the uh, the stores. As long as they meet, obviously, the official plan and the, the zoning, they would have to follow those same uh, rules, but we we cannot set different separation. One thing that I do want to point out um, that we have the ability to provide comments to the province when applications come in um, for a license within our municipality. And if you look at the report and the attachment in Exhibit A, which is a policy, policy statement, it does provide some recommendation that we could uh, give to the province, which they can consider as far as distances from other sensitive uses that are not schools, um, that we would like to consider as well. But having said that, it, it is still the, the province that would decide if they would follow those recommendations or not. Thank you for that. Um, and one more question. So I know that this is a merge into it. We're merging into um, the world of, of cannabis retail. And, um, and so we will be able to monitor, as you say, like in a year. Like, do we know how many retail sites we could have in a year? Are we limited how many sites? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, the, the only thing we know at this point, and this seems to be some evolving information, and even as late of December, getting some additional information, is that uh, for April 1st, 2019, the eastern area, the eastern part of Ontario would only have five licenses. So we don't know which municipalities would be selected that would be a lottery it's a lottery process that's going to take place having said that uh, we do recognize that the intent of the province is to increase that number over time because that is part of the reason why they wanted to go ahead and, and privatize uh, the retail stores Okay, and so I guess that's my point was, so if it's a merge and we, we get the retail, that's, I'm, I'm just concerned that we have um, how, how we manage that. And, and, and so you're confident that we can manage this well and that we have the right people in place to do that. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you. And through you, just, just to be clear, uh, the, the city does not, uh, or city staff are not involved in any way oh. with any of the license um, review or approval. That is all at a provincial level. Okay. Uh, we are consulted, so we would provide feedback on a proposed license. We have 15 days to do that. 
Um, and one thing I do want to point out is that we did look at other provinces that had already started to implement retail stores in Canada because there are a number of them that did go ahead and we had a presentation earlier tonight to find out what were the significant issues um, that their community were facing and, and we contacted municipalities. So what we heard from those um, were primarily the lack of supply, actually to be quite frank, that has caused a lot of of uh, problems in terms of, in some cases, stores having to close and the public not understanding and so on. So there doesn't seem so far to be significant issues in those communities, uh, but again, it's very, very early on in the implementation. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor, will you take the chair? I take the mayor. <laughs> it's okay. It's 11, it's 11.30, so... I take the chair, and I recognize you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, it was very interesting to, to see the feedback from the public consultation that was done in advance of this decision, and I'm really glad that we were able to do that. Um, I have a feeling it was one of the um, most popular... Uh, items that we have put out for public consultation probably since the casino. So it was interesting to get such an uptake. And, uh, and there were certainly a couple things that were very clear. But number one, cannabis is legal. And number two, the majority of our community seems to definitely be in favor of having a physical retail store option. But what was interesting is that the number one concern by far that was raised in the public consultation was exactly what Councillor Osterhoff has raised, and that is the issue of proximity. 150 meters away from a school is almost across the street. Uh, and as Commissioner Hurdle has said, well, what about, what about proximity away from youth centers? What about mental health and addiction centers? Uh, what about distance away from other cannabis stores so that we don't create a clustering effect if that's what's going to happen? So I, uh, I understand the landscape and where we're at, um, but based on that concern, I would uh, like to propose an amendment. It's been seconded by Councillor Doherty. I'm just going to ask if staff can, can put this up. Deputy Mayor, would you like me to read the amendment or would you like to read the amendment? I don't mind, I'm awake now. Uh, so this is an amendment by Mayor Patterson, seconded by Councillor Doherty, that Report 8, Clause 1, received from the CAO recommend, be amended by inserting the following paragraph. So this is paragraph 6 of the uh, recommendation. That Council request the Province of Ontario to provide the City with regulatory authority to further restrict the location of cannabis retail stores based on proximity to other city-identified uses, such as schools, community centers, youth facilities, and other cannabis retail stores. And Ms. Mr. Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. So just to be clear what, what this amendment does and does not do, as we've already heard from staff, municipalities do not have any power to regulate location. My personal feeling is that that's a mistake, that we should have some ability and some authority to regulate on location. So this is, quite frankly, a request of the province to give us that authority. And because of the supply issues, because of the fact that clearly um, the rollout of retail stores will be slower, um, that that would give time for us to be able to make progress on that. Now, I am going to say this. I know that having heard from proponents here locally that are interested in opening retail stores, they have already assured me that they intend to uh, go well beyond 150 meters. I've, I've heard uh, as much as 750 meters uh, uh, or, or more than that. So while I appreciate that that's what we've heard from uh, proponents and that's encouraging, I still would like for the city to have that kind of authority in case we had uh, I don't want to say a bad apple, but if we had a retailer that was not sensitive to those concerns, that could eventually that could actually um, uh, could go within 150 meters of another store or within a sensitive use. So that is the intent behind this. Uh, again, my my intention is to support the staff recommendation, but I think that this is a 
really critical piece for us to be able to send a statement at the same time that we need some more authority and control on the location side. Thank you, Your Worship. Just for just because uh, I'm looking at this, could you please clarify as the mover uh, two things? When it, city identified, is that city council identified or uh, city city like is that identified through a report to council or is there, is there a way? To, uh, how do we define city identified? So the way that I would interpret this is that we would have the power to restrict locations, so we would be able to make those decisions on city-identified uses and what the proximity would be away from them. So that's exactly the point of this, is that we would have that decision-making power. And the other clarification would be youth facilities. Is, is there a definition attached to that? Uh, like, to, For example, does that include daycares? So... I suppose that, again, since the motion is asking for it to be city identified, that that's something we could clarify. Uh, my concern is probably less with a daycare, so to speak. I'm not sure that there's many people of daycare age that would be um, perhaps tempted by cannabis use. But uh, if I was to think about something like the Boys and Girls Club uh, or, or a similar temp type, that would more be a youth facility in my view. Okay, so does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Councillor Neal. I want to thank the mover and the seconder. This was my primary concern. And for those of us that are on public health, this is the primary concern, one of the primary concerns we heard uh, in the discussion at public health. It's really, really unfortunate that the current provincial government has define this in such a narrow way, 150 meters from schools. I mean, we have zoning, uh, all kinds of zoning powers about payday loan locations, about uh, adult entertainment locations, and something as important as this, uh, we should have that, those zoning abilities as well. And I know uh, that Toronto and many other cities have made this same complaint. So I'm hopeful that the province will fulfill their promise to empower municipalities, as uh, Premier Ford has said on numerous occasions, and give us those abilities uh, to fashion a, a logical policy for, for Kingston. Uh, so I totally, totally support uh, this, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that the province will listen to us and many other communities and give us those powers. And to do that soon, because uh, if they start awarding within uh, or just outside of those 150 meter, then those places will have what's called existing non-conforming use and will be able to continue regardless of what future laws may say. So, uh, so hopefully this will get resolved sooner rather than later. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak to the amendment? Seeing none, I will call the question on the amendment. Please vote. And that passes unanimously, and I return the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, next on my speaker's list, um, do, do, do. Councillor Neal, you've spoken to the main motion? I haven't spoken to the main no, motion. No, that's right. So you're next on my speaker list. So Just one. one very quick question. I was also concerned about the one-time uh, funding uh, for startup funding, uh, but perhaps you could clarify, is there, even though the amount may not be spoken to yet, is there commitment from the province for ongoing funding to municipalities? And 
we'll, when that funding is identified, will both public health and police have an opportunity to express their needs because uh, harm prevention and education are definitely public health priorities. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, the 300, estimated $300,000 is the initial uh, proposed grant if the municipality opts in by the province. If you look at page uh, 89 of your package and 13 of 15 of the report, there are, there are a couple of paragraphs in here that also speaks about potential future uh, funding. It doesn't talk about ongoing necessarily funding, but it talks about the fact that the province has set aside $10 million of municipal uh, funding to address costs from unforeseen circumstances, and that the priority of this funding will be given to municipalities that have not opted out. So that's obviously the potential of future or additional funding. And just below that, the next paragraph, it speaks to the Ontario portion of the federal excise duty on recreational cannabis if, it, if it's over um, the uh, threshold of $100 million, if it exceeds that during the first two years, that the province will provide 50% of the surplus exclusively to municipalities that have not opted out. So there is definitely some potential for additional funding in the longer term. Um, we would, uh, from a staff perspective, take the same approach as we took for this report and work closely with both public health and police services. We have been doing that for months. Um, I just want to reassure council that the, the number that is showing and is recommended for public health is really what they came back with to run the public education campaign that they felt was necessary. So we haven't gone back or reduced their numbers or asked them to, to do less in terms of public education. Actually, if anything, they're gonna be doing more because we know edibles are coming online in 2019. Thank you. Okay, next on my list is Councilor Bohm. Thank you, Worship, and through you. I think uh, part of this, uh, conversation has been very uh, good and also the fact that the concerns that I heard again were around the proximity to school so that's basically been dealt with with the amendment so now I'm going to speak with some of the other concerns that I've heard and a few people have just said you know why would we not just opt out and and let this happen in a year so uh, in speaking to that uh, opting out will essentially reduce the funding by if my calculations are correct $145,000 and that funding is going to go towards training police and also public health, as was mentioned earlier. So if we opt out, then essentially we're not really preparing for something that we're forced to opt into within a year. So that's not really a good policy. And we're also turning down $145,000, which we would have to then, at some point, one would assume make up, which would then be going back onto the Kingston taxpayers. So neither one of those really sound like a good plan. Um, it, it's happened, it was legalized federally, everybody's aware of that. Uh, people can have it mail ordered to their house. So essentially this is just fiscally prudent to approve this motion. Um, people in Kingston had a chance to speak to a survey, it came in and whether you agree with the results or not, that those are the results and the vast majority seems to be in favor of this. So it's something where it's late in the night, I hope we can approve this and everybody can go home before tomorrow morning. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I remember hearing from a former mayor, and he gave me a piece of advice. He said, he said, Brian, council meetings should always start and end in the same day. So I'm not sure we're going to make it this time, but uh, for, future, uh, for future reference. Uh, next on my list is Deputy Mayor Stroud. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, I'll go straight to my question to the commissioner. To this, uh, the point that started out with Councilor Kiley asking about the uh, the, the sticker shock that you get when you first look at the numbers of how we would spend that 300000 of that first um, amount from grant. And I'm satisfied with the response. It's just a comment on the number that you got from public health, having sat on the board and being a nurse, is that they, they, they may be a self-limited number, as in they, they, they limited themselves to one initiative, 
and that's what the one initiative would cost. If there is indeed a future grant money from the federal excise percentage, that could potentially be a lot more than this initial money. Um, that's where I think it's relevant that we really think about what we could do to help public health. Because as time goes on, the and as uh, the police become more and more familiar with the system uh, and with the, the the application of the laws, their costs won't, you know, necessarily. Uh, you can't know as crystal ball, but they may actually be contained. Whereas the public health cost and the the uh, the cost of addiction and of um, uh, of all the negative health effects, and especially what I, what I hear most, the detrimental effects on development of uh, non-mature minds, like underage minds, so teenagers, children, um, once it's, you know, readily available everywhere, just like cigarettes, uh, kids get their hands on them, that kind of thing is public health. That's, how, that's what Councilor Neal was talking about. So I was wondering if there's any way you could give me an assurance if there are future monies coming to us from the various grant streams, is there any way we could, uh, you know, earmark more, a greater percentage for the public health initiatives? Because I'm sure if they were given the opportunity, there's all kinds of different programs they could set up uh, for health promotion and uh, harm prevention. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor. So. Um, just to, to be clear, we, we didn't provide public health with a limit or, or give them direction to say you can't exceed or you have to only do one program. We asked them to put together a campaign that they felt could uh, achieve the goals that they were trying to achieve, and they provided us with the layout of their campaign and what they were proposing and the cost um, as a result of that. But um, definitely, I think in terms of the long term, public health will have some ongoing and continued work to do as far as education, where police, uh, the cost in terms of training may be more initial because of the implementation, but in the long term, these costs should stabilize or even reduce because there's an initial push to train a lot of staff but after that, it should be, you know, um, a, a more limited number of staff that are getting trained uh, with staff turnover and those types of things. Thank you. I just know it would be a real shame because when I did sit on public health, we heard about the success of their smoking cessation initiative. Uh, you all recall, um, you know, when we were kids, uh, Smoking was much more prevalent than it is today. Uh, you still see it, but it is much less common, especially amongst youth, actually, than it used to be. And the public health had a big part in that here in Kingston. Uh, their smoking cessation was a wild success. It's kind of ironic that now another inhalable and smokable substance is coming to prevalence, and the health effects of simply just the inhalation of cannabis uh, uh, smoke uh, as uh, and, and there's no question that it's less harmful if uh, uh, professionally produced, uh, commercially produced than it is when it's just on the black market. No question. However, it still is a concern. Be really, ba really sad if we were back to where we were with smoking, with tobacco smoking. You know, 30 years later, after all that hard work the public health did. So I think we should support them if if we get the chance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hill. Just, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm very uh, pleased to see this legislation on, on the whole. It, when I, in my days as a principal, I certainly saw a lot of damage uh, that was incurred by young people. Um, ironically, the damage typically was a result uh, not so much of the drug use, but the, the penalties that were imposed on kids and, and, and what happened to them afterwards. And I was always worried about the safety of marijuana and, and, uh, and where the young people were getting it, you know. Uh, I think this is going to alleviate so much of that. Uh, so on the whole, I'm, I'm very uh, supportive of this. I, I think that uh, given the fact that I support the new regimen, I think it would be kind of hypocritical to turn around and say uh, that I only support the sale of it uh, online or in another community uh, and not here in our own. I, I think the last thing we want to do is replace one potentially harmful situation with another, and that is kids, young people, uh, hopefully of age people, hopping in their cars and driving to another community to purchase uh, this uh, this product. So uh, I, I hope uh, uh, that uh, 
this uh, um, motion passes tonight. Um, I think, I do regret, uh, I think, that the, uh, that the ultimate decision uh, was made not to allow the LCBO to, to manage this product. I think they were well equipped, they had the facilities and the training to do an effective job of monitoring the product and, uh, and, uh, and ensuring that it stays in, in the hands of the people that it, it should stay in. Uh, at the end of the day, it's gonna be a lot safer in our schools because uh, just like alcohol, you know, is not as, as readily available in a school as pot was when it was on the black market. I think that this is gonna make a big difference in terms of eliminating those people who would deal in school. So on the whole, I think it's a good thing for Kingston. At the end of the day, it's certainly supported by the community and I, I support it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next to my list is Councillor Chappelle. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, my comments actually pertain to the uh, initial allotment of the uh, $300,000 implementation cost. I listened intently to uh, Councillor Kiley and Councillor Stroud and I actually would prefer to pull that section out of the recommendation and have that go back to council and have both the police and health services present before council. And we basically, as councillors, since we're gonna wear this topic and this issue, we'd be the ones responsible for how that money gets distributed um, with the guidance of, of staff. I, I don't feel comfortable I, with this in the sense that Having served formally on the Parole Board of Canada, I, I certainly revoked day parole for offenders who uh, used marijuana just you know, recently before it was legalized. I'm certainly, as a parent, very concerned about the health impacts to teenage brains. I am not a user, although I might look at tonight with my little bit of facial hair, <laughs> and the fact that I like heavy metal, so uh, here we go. Um, but. Um, I, I'm very concerned about the public health impacts, and so my, my preference, knowing that the policing budget is coming forward, I'd like to see where this shows up in their line items, I'd be much more supportive of putting that whole allotment towards public health. That, that would be my impression. So I'm not sure how to remove that section, and then if we could remove the allocation of those funds, I could be in support of this motion. Report okay, rather. so Councillor Chappelle, what I would, uh, what I would recommend is that um, you can just separate out one paragraph number four. So what we'll do is we will call uh, we will call a vote on everything except for paragraph four, and then we'll call a separate vote on sure. paragraph four. Thank you. Okay. Um, is there anybody else that wishes to speak to uh, the recommendation, Councillor Hutchison? Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I just first of all, uh, the thing I heard at the door. Uh, which wasn't a great deal, as one other councillor said, uh, was often based on the person thinking that council has way more control over what's happening than it actually does. And that was clear even during the election and crystal clear now. Um, so as it says in the report, um, the province will receive, renew, grant, etc., revoke all cannabis retail licenses. So my question to the staff, just for information, is is that the way most retail licenses work? I thought they were, we get this at appeals. It seems to me it was a municipal matter, but perhaps I've mistaken the jurisdiction somehow. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So um, municipalities typically have authority to grant licenses for a number of different uses. So you probably um, see that or recall in the budget we have revenues, for example, from licensing, and, and they vary. It could be restaurants, it could be uh, spas, it could be different types of things, right, that we have uh, the ability to grant licenses. In this case, the province has removed or hasn't granted, I should say, municipalities with that authority, so has kept that authority at the provincial level. Right, thank you. So that, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be sure because it's not worded that, for good reason, not worded that way in the report. Because I, I think it's just important to say to the public, you know, uh, the province has changed the rules for this product. It's not the way licenses are usually uh, issued and so we have very little control over it. I will say that <clears throat> like Councillor Hill 
I would have preferred the LCBO uh, model because uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, they're used to um, enforcing the, the rules in, around what whatever limitations or restrictions are going to be. And also the money would go more directly to the public purse, perhaps to offset some of the costs that may be coming down the road, uh, or general funds, I mean, as the LCO works. So um, as for, I, I just want to say that I think it'll be, as the as Commissioner said, two or three years before we get the full rollout, the full implications of this. And um, I have to say that anyone who thinks that organized crime, uh, whether it be the odd, whatever, mafia or Hells Angels or whatever, is going to just drift away is deeply kidding themselves. They're going to double down on things that are worse than marijuana, <laughs> okay, like cocaine, amphetamines, heroin, and the like. So that's, is that, how much of that is a fallout? Well, we're going to see from the decision to legalize. I'm actually speaking as someone who was in favor of legalization for many, many years. Now I think well, maybe some things should be left illegal with no punishment or something, you know, <laughs> or some kind of gray areas. Sometimes does work because human beings are kind of opaque at times, what they want and need. So anyway, that's I'm going to vote for this, obviously. So um, I would say to um, Councillor Chappelle's desire. I understand where you're coming from. I was thinking the same way myself. I wanted to at least hear from them where they were going to put the money, although the commissioner did give us a thumbnail sketch. But the fact is, if this is what the police think, we can't tell them to do otherwise. And the same, I believe, is true for public health. We fund them, but we don't have a heck of a lot to say about what they do. So. That's just unfortunate. Maybe it's unfortunate, maybe it's really good because you get a standard across the province that way. So, you know, that's just the way it is. So, thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship. I'm supporting the recommendation to opt in with Ontario's two largest cities, Toronto and Ottawa, already saying that they're opting in. Then I don't think there's any turning back. The provincial government isn't going to change its mind and start using the LCBO. It's, um, the decision's already been made, and I don't want to lose our funding source. My main concern with this was that there could be a store at every corner, and with the supply problem we have, I'm finding out it's only going to be five stores across all of Eastern Ontario. Ontario and it's going to be lottery based. We have, you know, a, a chance of just having one store, maybe two stores, and that will be good that it will be spread across the city and um, the police can monitor, you know, the, that low number of stores, see how it goes as for the big rollout. And uh, that's why I'm supporting it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll be supporting this as well. I think the um, the implications in terms of um, decriminalization, well, to the extent that we are no longer um, imposing criminal sanctions on individuals and allowing them to be able to access a safer product um, through this recommendation, hopefully, down the road, uh, all those things are very positive. And I'd also just like to take a moment to thank staff for all the work and for... Um, for bringing us the recommendation this evening. Thank you. Thank you. We will call the vote on clause one. And this is as amended. Oh, yes. Yeah, so what we're going to do, uh, just having a second look at it, uh, we're going to separate out paragraphs four and five, uh, because I think that that would be necessary for, um, for Councillor Chappelle. So first we will do the vote on paragraphs one, two, three, and six. Please vote. And that carries. Now we will do a vote on paragraphs four and five.
Please vote. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Doherty, point of order. Point of clarification. Are okay. we voting now to remove them or yeah. we, okay. So if you are comfortable with what those uh, allocations are, you would vote in favor. If you are not, uh, and you would want council to retain control of it, then you would vote against. Okay, so I'll now call the vote on paragraphs four and five. And that carries by a vote of nine to four. Okay, uh, nothing from Committee of the Whole tonight. Uh, information reports, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Uh, Emergency Management Program Review 2018. Okay, no information reports from members of council. Miscellaneous business. Uh, first, that as requested by the MS Society of Canada, City Council proclaimed the month of May 2019 as MS Awareness Month in the City of Kingston. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Neal, seconded by Councillor Hill. Please vote. And that carries. Number two, that Francis Smith be confirmed as the County of Frontenac representative for the Housing and Homelessness Advisory Committee for a term ending November 30th, 2020. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, on to uh, new motions. New motion number one, moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Chappelle. Whereas the first Administrative Policies Committee meeting is scheduled to meet on February 14th, 2019, whereas the Administrative Policies Committee has a mandate to study and report to Council on matters which include strategic planning, whereas Council has an opportunity to augment an aspirational strategic planning process which directs staff for the next four years, whereas the previous strategic planning process did not afford an opportunity to conduct a SWOT strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis, and address risks associated with policy options, fiscal pressures, and threats and opportunities. And whereas conducting a SWOT analysis would permit public input to provide creative solutions and establish priorities to address such risk factors and opportunities, excuse me, therefore be it resolved that in order to augment and improve the outcomes of strategic planning, the Administrative Policies Committee meet on January the 17th, 2019, in order to at least establish a working group, a process to engage with community stakeholders, a baseline questionnaire, which includes, but is not limited to, topics such as affordable housing, homelessness, job attraction, retention, post-secondary enrollment pressures, climate change, the opioid crisis, heritage preservation, barriers to growth, and intergovernmental inter relationships, etc., and that this working group report back to the Administrative Policies Committee on February 14th, 2019, with preliminary results of stakeholder interviews and a timeline to complete the recommendations to Council to date with sufficient time to inform the strategic planning session in March 2019, and that the Administrative Policies Committee report back to Council, having conducted a SWOT analysis of the City with stakeholders with recommendations on the strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats that should inform Council's strategic planning process in March 2019. Council McLaren, point of have, order. Point of order. Yes, um, it seems to me, in hearing all of those things, that virtually everything within that motion has come forward in the form of amendments for the previous, and were uh, unsuccessful amendments. So, wouldn't this motion be contrary uh, to the amended, uh, the amended report? with recommendations that we have passed. I'll leave it up to you to determine. Yes, so I have looked at that. Um, my, my interpretation is that this motion is essentially uh, an additional form of public consultation. Does it conflict with the public consultation that we have already approved? I suppose it, it could stand on its own, so I, I think I'm going to allow the motion to come to the floor, but then I think that's one of the things we're going to have to debate. So, Councilor McLaren, you have the floor. Thank you, and you're quite right. This is uh, very similar to a lot of the stuff that's been going on. And um, so, to speak on how this is actually different, um, everything that we moved earlier is a good thing and it's in a good improvement. So, if I may suggest that there are different ways of doing SWOT analysis, there are different ways of doing strategic planning, perhaps we could consider this a pilot project on a different way of doing it. Um, part of what uh, inspired me for this was the way that public health did this, and I believe you've seen the uh, documents for that. Another one that inspired this was a book called The Wisdom of Crowds, the idea being that um, 
more of us, if handled properly, are wiser than fewer of us. And perhaps, if we do this correctly, it can augment, it can provide different ways of doing things, and we can judge to see if we want to continue doing it four years from now. Um, and essentially, it's not going to cost staff that much because it's going to be through a working group. Uh, so I'll just leave it at that, and I'll answer any questions if uh, they come up or objections later. Deputy Mayor Stroud. It's 12.09, I call the question. Okay, there's a motion to call the question. Um, is there a seconder? Seconded by Councillor Neal. Mr. Clerk, can I see you for a moment? Um, okay, so it requires, motion to put the question requires two thirds to pass. Is there, was there a seconder? Yes. Who was the seconder? Thank you, Councillor Neal. Thank you. Okay, motion to put the question. Still waiting for one. Uh, and that carries, well, no, it does not. So it does not reach the, uh, the two thirds. Um, Deputy Mayor, would you take the chair? I take the oh. chair, I recognize you, but I also see Councillor Chappelle. Uh, do I have the floor? You have the floor. Okay, thank you. I just, so I actually would have voted in favor of putting the question, but I just felt it was important just just to provide a different perspective from the mover. Um, my personal feeling is, and again, I appreciate the intent about doing public consultation, but I believe the public consultation that we have already agreed to is a far better way to go. It is more inclusive, it's broader, uh, there are many different forms of it. Uh, it uh, is also directly uh, applied to council. Uh, so for example, uh, I think we've already heard about the concerns about going to administrative policies committee. I think that that still holds. Uh, and also, I, I think it's extremely unwise to have a, a, a list of topics that could be priorities. In my view, this is exactly the problem that we had before, is that we're prejudging where, where this would go. So my feeling is that the public consultation is well handled by what everything else. I did not rule, of order because, rule it out of order because I believe that it is an additional form, but I think it's far, uh, it's far more problematic. And so for that reason, I would encourage council to vote against this motion we have a very good public consultation process that we've already been put in place. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. I return the chair and remind you that Councillor Chappelle had his hand up earlier. Councillor Chappelle, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, having gone through our, our very productive and uh, at, at times testy uh, discussion this evening, the premise behind what that motion, which I think is actually quite well written and a lot of effort went into it. I have to give a lot of accolades to uh, Councillor McLaren for helping piece that together. Um, the purpose of the, the uh, listing was not to be exclusive. It was just a, a baseline of topics. And it was an opportunity to really augment the, the consultation process with the community, the SWOT analysis, because it's sincerely, when I look at strategic planning, we have these, the, we get a group of people together, we're all excited, we're talking about our, our areas, and we have this very uh, forward-looking approach to things, but we often don't take time to reflect on what our risks are. And that's why when, uh, when Councillor McLaren approached me about this idea, I, I said, let's focus on the SWOT analysis. And now that has been incorporated into our new plan. That has been incorporated into the, the, outgo the, um, the extensive community outreach that we're going to participate in. And for that reason, I, I kind of look at this motion now and, and see that it, it, it's somewhat redundant. And uh, for that reason, I regretfully, but just I'm having explained that, I'm going to remove my uh, seconding of this motion. Okay. Uh, thank you. Is there somebody else that wishes to second it? Okay, Deputy Mayor Stroud, uh, we'll put his name. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Oh yes, Councillor Carley. 
Very briefly, Mr. Mayor, through you, I echo Councillor Chappelle's sentiments. I think the spirit behind this was right on. Uh, I was intending to support it until uh, right before Council has made aware of the amendment, which we worked through at length, uh, which engaged us in public consultation. I think adding another layer, uh, perhaps seemingly even a different process at this time, would confuse the public and be detrimental to the overall spirit, which we all agree to, which is more transparency and greater accountability for us as elected representatives. So regretfully, I too will be voting against this. Thank you, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship. And uh, just to speak with this, I think we've had a little bit of taste of uh, what strategic planning is going to be like because we've uh, had a bunch of ideas tonight and we've kind of come to a conclusion. And uh, with with this motion here, I just I just want to raise a caution that when you talk about it not being the exact same thing. It, 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 it is not the exact same thing, but it is a very similar duplicative process. And there are costs to all these things. And one of the things I want to point out, which maybe is not top of mind all the time, is that our staff and their time are a resource as well. So if we're going to do all this public consultation and we're going to go out and we're going to do what we decided on earlier, and then we decide to do this, we're duplicating a lot of that work. And when we talk about efficiencies, that is not an efficient way to do it, and it can. It, there's a risk of creating confusion as well. So, in the interest of being fiscally prudent, managing staff's time and their resource, and not duplicating a process, I'm going to have to vote against this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Doherty. I just want to thank Councillor McLaren and Councillor Chappelle for um, bringing this motion forward today. It really allowed for a lot of rich discussion. And without that, we wouldn't have had that discussion probably today. And it has given us, and, and the time is really important because this, we do need the time to put the process in place as we discussed earlier in the meeting. Um, this really has resulted in more in a more open and transparent process and the more public consultation is fantastic. We will be better for it. So I really want to thank you and commend both of you for bringing this motion forward. I will not be voting for it because I think what we did come up with is actually better. Um, but you started the process. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Councilor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I see this whole process that we went through tonight is sort of an inevitable, inevitable uh, maturation of, of the strategic planning process for the city in the sense that we've done it twice before formally. I suppose in some different, more vague, more opaque way it was done before, like it wasn't done when I was first elected, but to give the CAO credit, our current one, he brought it in and along with other staff and um, has pursued it. So how did it get started? Well, staff had to do a lot of stuff because you know you had the 13 cats and you couldn't get them wrangled together properly. And, um, and so I see now that this is a bid by the two councillors, uh, uh, Councillor Chappelle and Councillor McLaren too, make us more accountable and make us own the process more. Over and over again, we kept saying, well, at that time, at the time of strategic planning, we will have to do X. We will have to make the priorities really clear. We will have to maybe differentiate between the new and the, and the ongoing, because it will be clear to us and the public what's going on. So I see this motion and the work that went into it as really worthwhile and as just an evolution of, of taking uh, more accountability for the processes that we're doing. We still need staff, we still need facilitators, that's all very clear. I think anyone's done strategic planning and uh, you know some of us have even conducted it. So, um, but I did think that uh, I wanted to thank the, the staff, those uh, council members for for putting all that work into it. And um, I, I, you know, I agree with a number of comments that other people have said, and including you know, making a list and 
you know, checking it twice <laughs> and find out there's no Christmas. And um, so anyway, that's, that's, I just think that I, I want to be clear about that. And, um, but I won't vote for it because I think it's redundant at this point. Now, we may be back here again, you know, sometime, and think, oh, you know, that could have gone better. We could have done X, Y, and Z. But that's to be expected, and that's part of our responsibility to the public, frankly. So, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Deputy Mayor Stroud. Just a brief comment. Um, in discourse, especially group discourse like this one, uh, after you've had a certain length of, of discourse, you, you tend to lose sight of where the conversation started. Um, and, and because, you know, time goes in one direction. I th I'd like to commend my, my colleagues that uh, had complimentary things to say about the mover for writing this motion, putting all the effort into it. And in essence, even halfway through the earlier debate, I was thinking to myself, wow, isn't this, isn't this great, the conversation that we're having, the actual discussion that we're having? Uh, it doesn't really matter uh, what the outcome is or even how it started. It's most important is that we're talking to each other and we're taking each other seriously and we're voting one way and the other and that's how council is supposed to function. So group discourse had a beginning. This was the beginning. So let's not forget if it wasn't for Council McLaren, we wouldn't be here at 12.30. <laughs> but still smiling and laughing because we know that we're doing our jobs. And I'm still going to support it because I promised him I would several days ago. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Council McLaren, you have the last word. Everything's good, thanks. Thank you. So we'll call the vote then on new motion number one. And that loses by a vote of 2 to 11. I will, we have no other new motions. Are there any notices of motion? Mr. Clerk, ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor Doherty, seconded by Councillor Holland, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2019-03 held Tuesday, December 18th, 2018 be confirmed. Please vote. Still waiting for one. And that carries. We have some tabling of documents, a number of communications. Is there any other business? Mr. Clerk, ask for bylaws, please. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that bylaws one through three be given their first and second reading. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw Number 2010-1, as amended, be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 1 three readings. Please vote. And that carries. Moved by Councillor Kiley, seconded by Councillor Osterhoff, that Bylaws 1 and 3 be given their third reading. Please vote. And that carries. Motion to adjourn, please. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Neal. Please vote. And that carries. Thank you very much.